organizing a large number of activities. Every day we are organizing a webinar from 3 to 4 p.m., uh, which is a live webcast on various platforms. And uh, today uh, we are happy that IIM Bangalore has collaborated with us in organizing this workshop on technology enabled learning for faculty members as a part of their capacity building program. Uh, today, I welcome Professor Rishikesh Krishnan, who is director I am Bangalore, I am Bangalore, and he has also been a former director uh, of I am Indore. I also welcome I am BX team, Professor Vasanti Srinivasan, along with other members, Srimati Vijaya Tripathi, Sri Diljit Kanan, Srimati Usha Ganeshan. I also welcome all the vice chancellors of uh, different universities who have joined us today, directors of uh, UGC, Human Resource Development Centers, Dean, various head of the departments, and faculty members of different universities who have joined the program today. Uh, we know that technology has become an integral part of our life and education. Uh, it's all pervasive and it has become, in fact, a part of our life in various ways. And we have seen in last two years uh, how during COVID period time, we have used the technology to overcome all the barriers to reach out to students uh, and faculty members in, in various possible ways. So technology has helped us a lot uh, in continuing education uh, during COVID times. Uh, all all levels of education, whether we talk about school education or technical education or higher education, all types of education had been greatly benefited. So, um, so technology has become a great enabler in higher education uh, any time for, uh, any, uh, for students uh, to access technology-based resources or e-resources from anywhere that has become possible now. And we had been taking um, a good amount of initiatives and efforts in this direction. In fact, National Education Policy 2020 also uh, gives a lot of emphasis on technology-enabled learning and acquiring 21st century skills, based, particularly based on technology. And in the, in the process, a National Education Technology Forum has also been established. Uh, some of the initiatives which uh, UGC has taken along with other um, agencies and, and ministries. This includes MOOCs uh, or uh, offering courses on SWAM platform. Online education has been a major game changer uh, recently. We have also tried to promote blended education by, by using technology enabled learning. Virtual lab is uh, one such phenomena which is making online education possible even in science and technology. National Digital Library, National Academic Depository, Academic Bank of Credits, and very recently, uh, the concept of digital university, which is soon going to come, is also becoming possible because of uh, technology. Uh, but as we integrate, integrate technology in uh, higher education systems, there is a need to uh, equip uh, all the uh, human resources which are involved into it. And particularly, there, there is a need for capacity building of teachers because uh, the, the teachers are going to play a key role uh, in adoption and integration of uh, technology as a very effective tool in all aspects of higher education, whether it's going to be teaching learning process or research and innovation. And at the same time, they may also use it in e-governance. So with today's uh, workshop is focused on a teaching uh, learning process, how technology is going to uh, play a, a key role in teaching learning process and how uh, faculty members can use it. We are really, very really happy that the IMB has collaborated with us and I hope that all the faculty members, they are going to have a great learning experience today. Um, I, uh, first of all, I request Professor Rishikesh Krishnan, who is uh, director I am Bangalore uh, to say a few words on today's occasion. Professor Rishikesh Krishnan. Yeah, namaste. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajneesh Jain. And uh, I would like to particularly appreciate the initiative taken by UGC to spread the 
message about technology enabled learning and also to give us this opportunity to work with UGC in offering this online workshop. I thought I'll take this opportunity to give you a little bit of historical background of the evolution of technology enabled learning at IM Bangalore. And this would also enable me to just point to a few priorities for the faculty who are attending this particular uh, workshop. So IMB started technology enabled learning mainly as a tool to reach out to a larger group of learners, maybe about 20 years ago. That was the time when a VSAT networks were being created by various private providers. And we looked at these VSAT networks as a way of enhancing our reach particularly for executive education. So we had used uh, some of the facilities of these uh, service providers by setting up remote classrooms and the participants were able to uh, participate in the courses offered by IM Bangalore for executives uh, through, these, uh, on, through these classrooms. Uh, initially, it was largely one-way audio and video and one-way only audio in the sense that the, we, we are not able to have video questions back from the participants in the distant locations. But soon that also changed and we were soon able to have two-way audio and video. And the classrooms at a distance were able to fully participate in our uh, educational offerings. A little later, we started offering one of our uh, diploma programs. Uh, at that time, IMs could only offer diploma. So we had a weekend MBA equivalent program which was being offered for the software industry. That was primarily offered in Bangalore, but then we also wanted to extend it to Chennai. And using the ISRO satellite network, we started offering it in a classroom in Chennai, again with two-way audio and video. So these were some of the early experiments. Actually, if I look back now, they were quite effective because many of the things we are trying to do today, we were able to do then as well. The only difference is that the students had to come to a specific location, which was the classroom. And they could not sit in their house or office and participate in these sessions. Fast forward a little bit, come to 2014. In 2014, we took the plunge into MOOCs. And at that time, we signed up with one of the international platforms, edX. And we became the first uh, educational institution in India to have a major presence on edX. So essentially, today, that partnership has grown quite a bit. We have about 60 courses running on the edX platform covering all the basic subjects uh, in management. And that has been a very important learning ground for us as far as MOOCs and online education is concerned. In fact, it is that experience with the edX platform and with MOOCs that helped us very quickly adapt to the challenges posed by the COVID pandemic in uh, 2020. So today we, of course, have all these programs and courses running on uh, the edX platform, but we are not offering any degree or diploma. These are all certificate courses, which are basically for those people who want to enhance their learning in those particular subjects. When the government started the Swayam platform, of course, we also started offering many of our online courses on Swayam. And I'm happy that we have several of our management courses now being enrolled by students across the country. And thanks to the farsighted decision of the regulators to allow students to take some of those courses for credit, today we have enrollment from institutions across the country. And that has been a very important development as far as uh, online education is concerned. When the pandemic started, we of course realized like everybody else that we need to quickly adapt ourselves to the changes that are happening. So we started uh, going online on all our courses, which were, of course, earlier only in the classroom setting. Thanks to our faculty who had been pioneers in online, thanks to MOOCs and other initiatives, we were able to make the transition quite quickly. But there were a few things that we had to learn from the more experienced faculty. For example, how to use all the tools of the online platforms to create a better learning experience how to make some changes in the curriculum in order to make the overall online experience more effective. Also small things like with what kind of methods of teaching to use. For example, typically we use a lot of case studies, but sometimes in online case studies don't work well, particularly if there are issues with bandwidth and so on. But anyway, we made whatever adaptations were required and we were able to very quickly get on stream and 
uh, ramp up the offerings to our students so that our degree programs were not affected. I think one uh, important uh, evidence of this is that for both the years uh, 2021 and 22, which were the pandemic affected years, our academic programs were more or less on schedule, very minor delays we had of two, three weeks. So our students were actually able to complete the program on time, graduate, get their degrees, et cetera. And all of this was possible because we were able to quickly move to the online uh, setting. So just to kind of conclude, I would just like to underline a few things which I think are important at this stage. The first thing is we all know that education is more than what just happens in the classroom. There is a lot of peer learning that takes place. There's a lot of exchange of ideas between students. In, in the classroom, outside the classroom, in the hostel, et cetera. So one of the challenges for online learning is how do we also incorporate all these elements of what you might like to call social learning. There is a broader social context in which learning takes place. And while the online classroom can take care of the instructional aspects, all these extra aspects which happen because of people interacting with each other, we need to find more creative ways of doing that. That's the first point I would like to make. The second point is that, of course, we also need to adapt our pedagogy and the content and so on to the online medium. I think there are going to be some sessions on that in today's workshop. So it's important to focus on how we can use the online medium in the best possible way. The third issue which we need to look at closely is engagement of learners. There is a very clear, clear evidence that in online settings, it's difficult to retain the engagement of the learners for a long period of time. So we need to be more creative in the way we sustain engagement, particularly having more interactive uh, interventions in the uh, online classroom, also doing evaluation maybe at much shorter intervals. There are many ways, and I'm sure those will also be discussed in uh, today's session. So this is so these are the three or four points I think which are very important for us as we look at embracing online learning in a big way. Uh, obviously, for the country to achieve its educational outcomes, we do need to embrace technology in a big way, but. I would also argue that we need to pay close attention to some of these other points to make sure that the overall educational experience is a holistic one and is not just restricted to what happens in the immediate learning process on the online classroom. So with these words, let me once again thank UGC, thank Dr. Rajneesh Jain, thank all the other officers in UGC and thank my colleagues at IMBX for putting this workshop together. A warm welcome to all the participants who have joined and I wish you a very good learning experience today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Krishnan, uh, for providing us a, a good background of how um, uh, technology-enabled learning it all started at IMBX and how EDX has joined and how it has uh, taken the shape which it is offering today. And you very rightly said that technology-enabled learning uh, presents a number of challenges as well and, and teachers have to understand that how it is happening and how to overcome them how to keep the students engaged and on the social learning part which you just mentioned i think all these issues will be taken up during the workshop and uh, through their queries and question answer session uh, teachers would be able to understand uh, the nitty-gritty and other nuances and one thing which they particularly uh, need to understand and remember that technology is only a tool it is only an uh, enabler uh, to facilitate the teaching learning, but ultimately it is a holistic development uh, which uh, takes place with the personal intervention of the teacher. So there comes the uh, real role of teacher. So I hope everybody will be benefited uh, by this workshop. So I, I request uh, you, your team and all the participants to come together and uh, let's launch this workshop of uh, technology enabled learning. So can we have the launch, please? All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Diksha and your team, um, Professor Vasanti and your team.
So I uh, request Professor Vasanthi Srinivasan and her team members uh, to take over for the workshop and have a wonderful learning experience. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Jain. Uh, and um, since Rishi has set the context for the larger uh, need and imperative of uh, integrating technology into learning, I'm just going to go into looking at what does it mean for us as faculty when we have to integrate this? Okay. Um, as uh, Dr. Jain introduced, I'm Vasanthi Srinivasan and I chair the digital at IIM Bangalore. But today when I wear my hat, I'm wearing it as a faculty member who's offered a course on the edX platform. The course uh, is called People Management. And uh, this course uh, was launched in 2014 and uh, even today runs on the platform and is one among the top five uh, courses in HR and um, people, man people management. So uh, today's presentation, I am basically going to talk from a faculty perspective. Uh, Vijaya, can I, we have the slide deck, please? Yeah, I find my um, uh, bandwidth is a little unstable. If at any point in time you find that you're not able to hear me clearly, um, if you can just send me on the chat or let me know, then what I will do is I'll put off my video and then I can just engage with you. Uh, can it go on slideshow, Vijaya? Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. So I'm going to first begin with just getting some concepts clear because pre-COVID, there used to be a number of words that would be used, blended, hybrid, technology-enabled learning, all kinds of that. But today, post-COVID, when all of us are looking at what does it mean to be able to integrate technology meaningfully when we are teaching, I think it's now coming down to call it blended, call it hybrid, but what are we really seeing? We are seeing, next slide, how can, um, there is an online component and there are two parts to the online component. First is online live, like what I'm doing just now. This is called online synchronous. Then there is online asynchronous, that is pre-recorded videos that are enabling the learning of the students. So when we say online, we include both live online in terms of what's happening now, but it also includes asynchronous content that is used online by the students, accessed online by the students. And then there is the third element of face-to-face -face instruction. By now it is clear that all these three can be blended in different ways. So therefore, the first thing as faculty we need to figure out is in our entire content that we have, what is online, live, asynchronous? What is li online, live, synchronous? And what is face-to-face? -face? Okay. So this therefore means that if you are doing an online course, or blended course of this kind, it takes away your discretion. You can't decide at the last minute what you want to do, like the way many of us faculty members do when we enter class. So we need both a clear schedule, but also some flexibility when you're designing because sometimes the online content that students consume may be too difficult for them. They may require some clarification or what you have provided there is just knowledge concepts, some frameworks, but in the class, you want them to internalize. Okay, So which means your course development has to have some flexibility in it. Third aspect, the beauty about blended learning is that it takes away the restriction of time and place. Students can read and absorb content at their time, at their place. And many times what we find is that students consume, I, I, 
I don't know about your institutions, but many of our students actually stay up quite late into the night. And sometimes I wonder whether we should be doing classes in the evening for them to have better engagement. So for those kinds of students who are in that context, Vasanti, it becomes very easy because they consume information at their Vasanti, ma'am. What happened? Vasanti ma'am, we've lost your audio and video. Just give us two minutes, Diksha. Okay. As uh, you can see, now can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Good morning, can you hear me? Ma'am, we can hear you. Vasanti ma'am, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you very much, thank you very much. Okay, I have switched to mobile and I will continue on this. Okay. So let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, we will uh, see that in, in the next slide. Vijaya, can you change the slide, please? You will see that our learners are changing quite dramatically. The 21st century learner is consuming information in a lot of video content is being consumed by the learner of the 21st century. Let's just take a little bit of time to understand who are these learners who come to our classroom. And I'm sure all of us complain about this, but that is their way of learning. First, they're all digital natives. You and I are digital migrants, which means we have acquired the ability to become digital. But the students who are coming into our classes are not just the internet generation, but they are the smartphone generation. They are multitaskers. They can have the phone on hand, they can talk to someone else, they can actually be keying in things, and they can do multiple things at the same time. And therefore their ability to cognitively process is inherently multitask. They are visually oriented because they're used to consuming so much of video content, 
and relatively impatient because Google allows them to search for anything, yeah? And just in a fraction of seconds. A large part of our learners today are conditioned to learning as something which is about acquiring something, acquiring knowledge, acquiring skills. So the purpose of education seems to be now about acquiring skills because information is all available on Google. This asks a bigger question of the role of teachers in general, but we will come to that in a little while. Most of our students are looking for personalization. They want us as faculty to connect information to them that they believe is relevant to them. Another one that our students are looking at Vasanthi, ma'am, we've lost your audio and video. Please uh, try to reconnect, ma'am. We can't hear you. Sorry for the apologies. Professor Vasanthi will join in no time. Am I audible? Sorry for the inconvenience caused. Yeah, Vijaya, you are audible. Okay, thank you, Diksha. So like Professor Vasanthi was talking about, you know, that uh, the new age learners have uh, consume uh, content in a very different way. So as uh, educators, it is very crucial for us to make sure that we focus on the curriculum or the pedagogy. So first, so the building starting point for any of the educators should be that they should understand how the learners learn. So if you talk about the 21st century learners, so as Professor Vasanthi mentioned that they're all very distracted digital natives, they'll do multitasking, they'll be on call, they'll be listening to the radio, they'll be Googling something. So they are very uh, multitaskers learners. They're very visually very oriented and very impatient. So uh, if you talk about the online learning thing, that is the reason we focus more on video content because we know that our learners are very visually oriented. And uh, current uh, 21st century learners, they do not want to focus on information. Gone are the days when they just want that a teacher should come into the class and they should only talk about, you know, uh, for example, definition of what is a people management or what is prioritization. So currently the learners want to focus on, tell me, how do I prioritize? Right. Or tell me if you're talking about delegation, how can I delegately, uh, how can I effectively delegate while I'm being a first time manager? 
So they are looking for all these skills. So the focus is on skills, not on information. Uh, moving ahead, uh, we do a lot of personalization and until and unless if we are not doing personalization as far as the asynchronous sessions are concerned, then there is no key takeaway for learners. For example, if I'm offering a self-paced course in which the learners come at their own wish, and if we as co-creators are, and, and we, if, uh, we as if co-creators are not focusing on how to engage those learners, you will see that majority of the learners drop out after first week or second week of content. So until unless you do uh, you do a lot of intervention, you will not be able to do a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, keep holding the learners. Uh, in, you know, in whether it is synchronous learning or whether it is asynchronous learning, the learners are always looking for new experiences. They also want they always want what is there in, for me. What new can I learn today? The moment they step into classes also, like we see, uh, the moment we interact with any PGP learners or any PGP learners, they always are focused on, you know, what is my key takeaway from this session? And finally, they talk about mindset. A technology on one time shot at a secure job, but now lifelong activity, because they all have understood this fact. And we all have also understood this fact that it is more about being a lifelong learner, because today what is relevant okay. will become irrelevant tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. Vijay, I can take over. Thank you. No, ma'am. Most ma'am. Yeah. Go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So let's very quickly look at uh, if the, there are so many benefits for learners. They can learn anytime, anywhere. It allows them to, us to personalize their learning. When they come into the classroom, they get, it gives them an opportunity to interact with faculty. So what? why is this important? Because you will also see that all the things that you're facing as challenge just now with me, which is I dropped off, I had to ask Vijaya to step in, and then I come back, I have a mobile with hotspot, I also, all of these challenges you will face live online. So in a way, one of the demands of it on us as teachers who do blended learning is to visualize all the possible worst scenarios that can happen because of technology. Yeah. So I'm glad that today we are having this demonstration because I'm sure so many of you are already disengaged and saying, OK, we've lost it. Now, what do we do? So as faculty, when we come back, how do we reconnect and then kind of take it forward? OK, this happens fairly regularly. And I'm sure many of you who have taught online during COVID would have experienced the same thing. Go to the next slide, please. I, I just want to be efficient so that we can open up time for questions and answers. more. So. While designing courses that are hybrid, I think as faculty members, there are three things that we need to bear in mind. And I'm particularly calling out these because these are problematic areas in general. So the first and the most important one is how do we conceive the course? How do we visualize this course? Second one is what kind of pedagogical tools should we bring into the class session? And third is how do I do learner engagement Online synchronous, online asynchronous, and face-to-face. -face. How do I build community? And how do I do effective assessment? All these three is what I'm going to focus on. Okay, Let's go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So let's just look at conceptualizing the course. And I will give you examples because I've used my course in many, many ways. So first is, when we are visual, please do not think that Online is transferring what I'm doing in the classroom uh, face to face. It means taking that and putting it online. Please, please, as faculty members, don't do that because that is a recipe for disaster. Yeah. When you are thinking of your course, open a sheet of paper and start with saying, which of the sessions that I am currently, content that I'm currently covering lends itself very easily to go online, asynchronous. Which content allows me to deliver it online synchronous? Which content cannot be delivered under any circumstance by online or pure technology medium? So the way you have to think at the course is to look at your sessions that you're covering and classify them into these three categories. 
So which is why I keep saying that please don't convert your existing course into an online course. It will be a disaster. Yeah. Or it will be nothing more than uh, shooting uh, your uh, lecture and putting it up. Okay. Then that is not technology enabled learning for sure. Okay. So the next question after that comes, let's assume that you've classified your sessions into these three categories. You can then pick up and ask, how much technology should I use for which content? Let me give you some examples of how we have tried. And I have particularly done this so I can kind of demonstrate also at a later stage. Um, and Vijaya will be able to share that with you in the session that's going to be hands on. So first is that I have even before the COVID, I have used videos extensively. I use a video to in my very first session of the course that I teach on the MBA program. Very first session, I use a video. It's basically to trigger thoughts on why is human resource management important for people to understand. Okay, I use the video and then have a classroom discussion. So for those of you who are new to technology and you're thinking of how to introduce technology in the classroom, the easiest way to start is videos to make a point or videos to generate discussion in the classroom. That itself is a first step in terms of preparation because you know what it is and where is it that you're going to embed some form of technology enablement. Once you have got that proficiency, you then start looking at um, Zoom polls or Mentimeter. Sir, I see a hand raised. Can I take the question at the end after the session? Yeah, thank you. So one of the uh, interesting ones is after that, the next level at which you could work is to do um, Zoom polls, Mentimeter, which is an app that is available, mobile-based, very relatively, very easy to do. You can put up a... So let's say you're discussing a case in the class. You could just ask, saying... How many of you think that what the person decided was correct? Yes, I think it was correct. No, the person was wrong. You can just poll that and you can put up on the screen and students can then begin to kind of engage. So to my mind, poll is a very low level intervention of technology. These two, if you're starting and you've never used technology in a, I, I, when I say you never use technology, all of us have used Zoom for uh, teaching in our, uh, during COVID. I'm not talking about that. If you have not brought in technology into your session deeply, I would recommend that you start with existing YouTube videos and then go to Zoom polls or Mentimeter. Both of them are very user friendly. And if you get stuck anywhere, your students will be able to bail you out. Okay. So that's the biggest advantage. After this, progressively, you're looking at videos recorded by you as pre-read. Okay. Let me give you an example. And again, I'm using examples from my area because that is what I know best. Look at a course, look at a topic on motivation. Motivation has so many theories, so many theories. You want the students to read in the textbook, but many times they don't read and come. That session actually helps you immensely because if you can innovatively put it in a video or podcast, audio podcast, that solves a lot of problem because you actually extract what are the content that you think is relevant for the students and put it into a podcast. Podcast is just listening. When they come to the class, you can actually test out through a graded quiz or a non-graded quiz. Okay? So that's another way to use videos every day effortlessly. Just record on your phone, put it up as a podcast. Done. Then you go about to looking at how can I use videos more deliberately, asynchronous. People will watch the video and come to the class. 
And then you can look at a little bit of digital quizzes in the classroom and then move to looking at offering a blended course. Okay. So to that extent, I'm just giving a buffet in some sense for anybody to start beginning to use technology in a deliberate and meaningful way into their teaching process. Next slide, please. Yeah. So um, let's now spend a little bit of time on how to think about how what tools to bring to the class. The day before yesterday, we had a faculty development program at IIM Bangalore. And we and this was the slide which had maximum conversation. Can you just show the whole slide, please, Vijaya? Yeah. So accounting, professors who were teaching accounting, professors who were teaching philosophy, professors who were teaching, teaching botany. Okay. We actually had a wide spectrum of faculty members who are thinking how they would like to use pedagogical tools in their uh, teaching. So first is that if you have got students to listen to a podcast or watch a video, you have to, when they come to the classroom face to face, make sure that you are asking questions to gauge their understanding, to make sure that they have understood. Please do not repeat the content, but make sure that you actually bring the relevant um, uh, ideas, the key points. You please bring that into the session. Since you have heard the podcast, let me ask you a few questions. Okay. What, what do you think? Why is that? So do all your questions based on the podcast and then have one slide which summarizes what are the key ideas that you would have presented in that lecture that you would have done in the class. Okay, so you see the blending, how you are able to do it. In class, mini review lecture. That's all you need to do. Five to seven minutes of speaking, summarizing. Many times people tell me that our students don't read. Yeah. So true, all over the world, wherever we travel, when we talk to people, everybody is saying the same, that in the last 10 years, reading habits among younger people has dropped. We know it, okay? And we also know, therefore, that video consumption has gone up, audio consumption has gone up. So we have to adapt and see how we could manage our traditional lecture, either through a podcast or through a video cast. Quizzes. I think we should not let our students look at quizzes as only grading yeah, for their uh, final uh, uh, grading component. Quizzes should be fun. And I do believe that it's possible to do that. And the way to do it is non-graded. Some simple examples that I have got when we have done FDPs is give set of five questions based on the podcast. Mix the papers, give it to the students in the classroom, ask them to evaluate. Finished. Okay. Non-graded completely. The person who's got it right, ask that student to present and say, how, what was the thinking? Finished. So these kind of ways of being able to manage classroom learning processes will become important when we are blending. Uh, case analysis. Usually, uh, thumb rule, I find that Case analysis is better done in the classroom. A summary of the case uh, key ideas to take back along with some reading material that you want to provide can be provided online. Small group discussion, do it in the class. Zoom meeting rooms, breakout rooms are very, very effective. The only thing is that the, you have to be clear about the question that you are asking. What's that question that you're going to ask? Yeah, because I am now discovering that if you're teaching online, the most important thing is the question. Earlier, when you're sitting in the classroom, you have the luxury of being able to rephrase, reform all of that. You will not have that luxury, particularly when there is, when you put them into Zoom rooms. I find that every time I want a breakout activity into the Zoom rooms, I am extremely mindful because I take a lot of time thinking about what is that question 
what is the question that I leave with people so that they can go to the Zoom room and discuss meaningfully. Yeah. So as faculty, I think there is a lot that we have to think in terms of the questions that we are going to ask when they break out virtually. In the classroom, you have the opportunity to be able to clarify. When they go into the Zoom breakout rooms, you don't have. So the clarity of your question has to be very good. Other formats that people tell me that they use extensively in online learning is debates, presentations. Uh, that it's not our students are not intelligent. They have reasonable intelligence. How can we use online discussion groups to be able to facilitate learning process? We are finding that there are different methods that are available. Vijay, I'd request you in terms of talking about the badges, talking about how can we recognize and uh, the, the, uh, some of that, if you can mention when you're walking through the presentation on uh, how to do it, I think that will be valuable. And last but not the least, if you're going to go complete online, let's assume that totally asynchronous, like we are doing now, you will realize that group assignments, group projects, group presentations are critical because that is what builds community and social learning process. So in online, you've got to figure out how to build good group work. Because ultimately, at the end of it, online or offline, the greatest learning happens when you're working with others and learning through others. Okay. Next slide, please. Yeah. So, uh, what, what have, what, I mean, I'm just reflecting on some of the key um, challenges for faculty when we have to switch to any form of hybrid. First is that I think proper planning is very, very critical. I think as faculty members, many times no, we walk into the classroom and depending on the preparedness of the students, depending on the um, on our own preparation, okay, if you're a young faculty, you're not confident sometimes, in which case what happens is the topic that you're not confident, you don't spend too much time, but you spend a lot of time on the, comp uh, on the topics that you're very comfortable with. Yeah, all of this happens. So uh, that luxury you don't have when you're online. Okay, so planning properly on what is the content that I'm going to give, how am I going to distribute it? I think that becomes very crucial. Okay, so I cannot tell you how much, what was it that I struggled most with? The most I struggled with was the fact that online learning takes away a lot of our discretion. It takes away a lot of our discretion. Yeah. So next slide, please. I want to keep some time for question and answers. So yeah. Assessment. I think this is an area where, uh, quite honestly, there's so much more work all of us need to do. I can quite confidently tell you that this is an area where we have to focus quite a lot. Because in online, it becomes very important to understand what are we assessing. While all the accreditation agencies give you broad parameters, remember that if you're doing an online assessment, you will typically require a large number of questions, a question bank in some ways. Okay? And then there are some fundamental questions. What can we test on MCQ? What is it that we will test open-ended? Should it be graded or should it be ungraded? How do we uh, look for awareness? How do we look for understanding? How do we look for different levels of testing of students? How do we build project presentations and online? So there are a lot of questions there, which at this point in time, I think we are also kind of working through this. In, on all the other areas, we have some expertise to offer very clearly. But assessment, I think, requires far, far degree of robustness in terms of thinking through. I hope that in the next three, four months, we will have something strong to present in this. Next slide, please. This is just a closing slide that the more I begin to look at it, the over the last eight years, I see that technology can dramatically enhance our learning experience. 
as you look into the future, it appears to me that there is no way that you can go back to the old traditional classroom teaching lectures that we used to do. Third, we are aware that faculty is possibly the most precious resource. So how do we ensure that faculty actually step up to doing more different things? I think that is very important, especially if you're an administrator of a university, because faculty scarcity is something that all of us are experiencing. So how do we make sure that our best faculty get time to offer innovative courses, to do things differently? I mean, how do we do that? That to my, um, uh, to my, uh, for me, that is a big one in terms of how can we um, scale uh, in the content and quality. And last but not the least, one of the things that uh, I have found on technology is that students whose medium of uh, uh, speaking is not English, students who don't have the confidence to be able to stand up and speak in the class, they are the students who post fantastic insights on the discussion forum. I've always wondered, how do you bring engagement from students who don't have the confidence to speak in the class? Is it important that they do? Yes. But is it very easy to acquire? No, we all know that, right? So how do we have those students actually engage? And I find that some of the finest insights and conversations on the discussion forum actually come from students who are not very strong English speaking. So technology for me in India today is an opportunity to be able to empower people who socially may not have had access and opportunity to the best of what education can bring. If we can structure the hybrid learning in a very meaningful way, I believe that social impact with quality education is what we can offer and deliver wherever we are in. And I believe that is the future as I look into it. Let me pause here and I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. You can use the chat to post the questions. Or you want to raise your hand, most welcome. Yes, Preeti? Preeti, you're on mute. Anyone else wants to go while Preeti joins? Yeah. Ha, huh. how to use online tools for accounting like subjects. Okay. Thanks, uh, Nishita. Good one. Yes. Um, so, uh, one of the first uh, things is that accounting and practical subjects are the easiest, as far as I can see, to be able to use uh, technology. Now, uh, last week, since we were talking about accounting, I think I have the uh, experience to be able to share some insights. We were talking about accounting extensively. So um, I believe that accounting, um, so let's assume that you ask your students to pick the balance sheet for one year of 10 companies. And let's assume that you're going to teach ratios. You will do two things. One is while they are doing the assignment of being able to identify and pick out the yeah. uh, required um, uh, concepts from the balance sheet. So one, you're actually getting them the ability to look for what it is that you're teaching, particularly on ratios. But the second thing that you're also doing is ask them to put that into an Excel sheet and send it across. What you now have as faculty member is, let's say you have 45 students and you have assigned 40, 50, top 50 um, uh, national stock exchange listed companies you have assigned to the students. You have on an Excel sheet identical data for 50 companies. And that becomes your resource for the next year. 
than you're teaching. So in some ways today, you have created your own practical content that students can use. And you can actually next year, if I were you, I would do the whole ratio analysis in the classroom using the lab format because it's all on Excel. I would demonstrate that in the classroom on how to compute. And then I would move and say, if you are an investor, which of these ratios will determine whether you will give money or not to the company? If you are a banker, yeah, you now see, right? You can use that data to demonstrate in the classroom and move the level of conversation for the next year on looking at application in real life. I believe that subjects like accounting, they have immense potential in terms of being able to use technology-enabled content. Yeah, I hope that is useful. I see one of your hands up, but I don't know your name because if your label is Samsung. So I'd like for you to be able to share. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes, good morning, ma'am. Good Actually, morning. I, yeah, I forget to rename the uh, model. I know. I know. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Rashtos Patak from North Pizza Patan. Yes. Yeah, Actually, looking at these technology and technical tools for the online education, so there yes. is a little bit question that will it be possible in future that this technology may replace the role of a teacher? Yes. Sorry, I, I, I love your question. I really love your question because I, I have thought about it immensely. Yes, and uh, I am now beginning to see, and I'll give you an example because nothing can uh, you know substitute for an example. You know, I this course that I was mentioning on people management on edX platform, it is completely online. Completely online. And I am not needed there anymore. My team takes care of it. However, it is so fascinating that yeah, on the discussion forum, right? People post such incredible questions that they are grappling with that my role in that course now, I don't have administration, I don't have teaching. All the contact sessions are led by my uh, team. What is the value that I am bringing? The value I'm bringing is I do a one and a half hour session, which is exclusively focused on responding to their real problems. So my value has actually increased in terms of what I bring to the table. Uh, you have to uh, switch on your microphone, switch on your microphone. Yes, but uh, does it bring two-way interaction as it goes on in the classroom? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. In fact, it brings even more uh, than what is possible in the classroom because you have only one hour, one hour and 15 minutes. So you have to cut short some student or the other always. Yeah. And whereas there, what happens is everybody posts. And so mm. that process is ongoing. Yeah. Okay. So means uh, this is somewhere blazing for us that we are able to switch plenty of students from the corner of the whole world, not from yes. India itself. Yes, yes, right. yes. Thank you for yes. Thank you, thank you very much thank for you. the successful and satisfactory answer. I'm pleased with that. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sorry, five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Mohammed. Mohammed, Rafi. you yes, have your yes, hand up? Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Yes, this yeah. is Dr. Mohammed Abdul Rafi, Assistant Director of UGC HRDC, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar Maratwada University. Ma uh, yes, thank you, sir. Yeah. I'm also a Faculty of Management Science, ma'am. So it's nice okay. to hear you. Yeah, yeah thank uh, my you. Basic, my question is that, ma'am, how much effective is the teacher's training when we talk about uh, the online courses, ma'am? Yeah. As per, what yeah. is your views on this teacher's training, ma'am? Yeah. Sir, so, um, I think um, one of the, I, I mean, I'm, I, I've been largely, largely reflecting on how we in higher education become teachers. Unlike the school education system, right? None of us have been trained. We've all landed up there and we teach. And I am just wondering if I have, we have to use technology to be able to transform higher education teachers training, 
I truly believe that this technology will possibly be the biggest intervention. And let me give you one or two examples. Uh, as a, Just as a part of our um, Center for Teaching and Learning at IIM Bangalore, they decided to put up short videos. That's all. Nothing fantastic. Uh, just short videos. And they asked faculty who are teachers, good teachers, to come and talk about what does it mean to teach and what tips. And it's called tips on the tap or something like that. And short clips, no more than five minutes where a lot of us came there to just talk about reflecting on our experience on teaching. I cannot tell you, there are some one or two clips that have 7,000, 8,000 views. And I then, you know, it kind of triggered saying that people are then waiting for that kind of uh, information, right? Young teachers, even seasoned teachers, you know, we want some, we want to upskill ourselves, right? So something like that, which is just five minutes clips that we have put, right? If that can attract and engage so much, I'm just wondering, why is it that we are not thinking of this? And let me give you some ideas on how I would do it, because I think you may be interested in that, is that I would actually ask each learner to record five minutes of their class teaching. And we can create a pool of um, experienced teachers. And I'm just looking at how we can enable technology, okay? Get them to upload their teaching video and they will get anonymous feedback. Anonymous feedback from a teacher who has taught that subject. And they will get feedback on what it is that they can do to improve themselves. Imagine if we could pull this off through technology, Mohammed. We have cracked it. And you can do that at scale because today uh, cloud is hardly the problem in terms of storage and stuff like that. Uploading a video content, if people can do it for TikTok, I don't see why they can't do it for uh, uh, a learning purpose. So I truly think it's possible if we think out of the box to harness technology very powerfully. Yeah. Yeah, you're on mute. Yeah. Uh, my my again, my question is that it should be a blended or it should be a full fledged. It will online. always be blended. It blended. will be blended. It will be blended. What, what, what and, we, have uh, we have implemented in our HRDC, we have made a mandatory for the teacher participants to upload the videos, create their own YouTube channel. Excellent. 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 Good. That's Thank the right you. way. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Juhi? Dr. Juhi, you are on yes. mute. Hello, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to know that as a teacher, if I want to check upon my performance in delivering the content on podcasts and videos, how do I do it? Because I've been doing this quite a few times, but there is no proper input on how effective I am. So send a, send a, I would send a two, uh, two um, uh, question uh, uh, to all the people who use your podcast okay, and ask them to give you feedback. And Thank your you. students are the ones, if you ask for a developmental feedback and you write to them saying that, I've been using this, what do you think I could do to do better? What do you think I should drop from this? What do you think is not working well? You will find that your students give you the best feedback. Okay, ma'am. So you'll be sending so it. My, my email I have the... dropped there. I have dropped my email in the box. Ah. So, I'm saying you send it to your students. No, I, those who okay. are using your podcast. Yeah. And yes. that send it to them and get feedback from them. That's what we do with our learners. Okay. We okay. do that all the time. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I think there's one more hand that is up. Again, I don't think you have renamed yourself, but that's okay. I think it's show me your phone. Okay. To uh, Dr. Ramavta. Sir, you're on mute. 
Dr. Ramavatar, you're on mute. Um, Professor, uh, meanwhile, there's a question on YouTube. Uh, Can we take that question? By yes, Jessie please. Uh, yes. She's asking that she has work on digital literacy on BH students. And yeah. she wants to understand how to make it more effective through technology tools. Uh, simulation. If she's already working on it, then she should move to looking at analytics and look at simulation. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Juhi, I think Juhi, uh, Jyoti, is it you said? Jyoti Mishra. Uh, Dr. Jyoti Mishra, then I would recommend that if you are already using a lot of this digitally, if you want to deepen the learning, then I think the next phase is um, uh, to look at simulation. Yeah. Uh, simulate classroom, simulate student experiences. I think simulation works very well. Gaming, augmented reality. Those are the three I think that will be the future if you're already doing your B.A. Uh, level uh, practical. Dr. Jaramta, you want? Yeah. Any other? Are there any other questions that I'm missing? Pooja Jain has asked for a question. Pooja Jain, uh, Upar. Jagan, right on top, Pooja Jain. Yeah, Pooja, you're, uh, uh, yeah, you're, uh, you're on mute. Yes, uh, uh, ma'am, thank you for a great session. Uh, since 2013, I've been developing uh, art programs online and uh, I went around India and collected all the traditional art lessons also. But I see that we have a missing support from UGC and even the universities that I'm teaching with for online learning of practical subjects. So how can I... Um, uh, present myself to UGC or the university that I'm working with to support the Good. learning of fine arts online. Okay, so one of the things I would recommend you do is the next session is going to be taken by my team members. First, I think it's important to conceptualize and actually build a prototype. Till you are able to build a prototype, people can't visualize how you're thinking of technology. Okay. So if you have a prototype, it will become easy for people to see. And thereby, I think whether it's UGC or any institution, once they see it, right, one session of the prototype, they can then buy into it. Yeah, I think that's a very important one nobody tells us. You can't just keep talking of how to use technology because not everybody can conceptualize technology. So my suggestion would be just use what uh, Vijaya and Diljit will present and uh, build a prototype. And look, building a prototype today hardly takes any money. So build a prototype with whatever resources you have and then demonstrate it to others. Okay. Yeah? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Vasanti, ma'am, one second. I would like to just come in. Uh, I'd just like to inform Pooja that UGC, uh, as, right, we have developed uh, MOOCs on visual arts as well as, you know, several uh, fine arts and visual arts subjects. So I would request you to send me an email and then okay. we'll take it for, uh, further from there, right? Good. Uh, how do, I think there's a very nice question. How do we use technology in class when we as teacher do not get disturbed and the class also does not get disturbed? Sir, you saw how I got disturbed just now, no? And you also saw how all of you got disturbed. You cannot use technology without either of us not getting disturbed. Okay. So will you get disturbed? Yes. Your connections won't work. Your camera won't work. You will have all the problems, sir. Okay. So please don't wish that you will be able to do it with no problem. It is not going to happen. Student bandwidth won't be there. They will not put on their videos. Some of them don't want to do their videos. They will be doing other things. All that is the reality. We can't wish it away. Yeah, but we also have that same problem in the classroom, right? Physically present, mentally absent students. The same thing, uh, camera absent, mentally absent students. We also have online digital. So my suggestion to you would be that just use technology. Just do it. That's all. And then, you know, you can figure out what works, what doesn't work. That would be my humble suggestion to anybody. Just use whatever technology. Don't worry. 
then you can adapt on it once you know how to use it. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks so much to each one of you for those great questions. And I hope that all of you will just embrace technology and just make ourselves more effective teachers. Yeah. On that note, I hand it over to my team and I think uh, you will enjoy the next uh, session because it's very practical, very practical. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks, Diksha. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Over to you, Vijaya. Thank you, ma'am, for this wonderful session and doing context settings for both of us. Uh, learners, we'll take a uh, we'll take a quick four minute break and we'll start sharp at uh, eleven a.m. Fine, we'll be back at eleven, right? Yeah, sure. Thank you.
A very good morning to all of you. I am Vijaya Tripathi, and I am here representing on behalf of IMBX team today. And welcome to this workshop on capacity building on technology enabled learning. So we at IMBX, the focus is always on two things: developing quality content and engagement of our learners. So today, throughout this workshop until one fifteen, we'll be focusing on these two things only. So as Professor Vasanthi has already mentioned, that we leverage a lot of uh, technological tools. So today we'll be leveraging a tool called Mentimeter. So we have put up a question for all of you: What is technology-enabled learning? And I would request all of you. Just give me a second. Yes. We are sharing the details on the chat window, so please uh, log in on menti.com and sign in using the code, and please uh, key in your answers to the question, which is what is technology enabled learning? We have given four options. The voting code is seven four double one three nine zero. Seven four double one three nine zero. We have started getting responses, requesting because I see one hundred and thirteen participants log in. Okay, okay. Yeah. At the onset, I would say that this is a very interactive session, and until unless you all participate, it would be very difficult to do context setting. I see only thirteen people have responded out of hundred and thirteen in the room. Very few responses, which we can see. Hardly 12, 3, 5, 15 people. It's 
it's a very simple question what is technology enabled learning according to you using postal system for correspondence is it a technology enabled learning creating social groups on fb using radio programs or using google classrooms for assignments last 20 seconds Okay, so we have closed the voting now, and we got responses from only very few learners. So, what is technology-enabled learning? Uh, if you see at this picture, you know it's a tablet of stones on education technology. So, was this technology-enabled learning? Yes, it was. if you see the bbc television studio and radio transmitters was this a medium of uh, technology enabled learning yes these are all the various forms of technology enabled learning which we have leveraged in the past so if i, if I have to define what is technology enabled learning it is basically the use of technology platforms systems digital content and the only objective is to enhance student centered learning so any of the mediums whether it is radio whether it is uh, uh, youtube whether it is uh, the ancient old technology of uh, bbc communication or anything they all come under technology enabled learning so as i have mentioned the technology enabled learning focuses on three aspects first is technology the second is platforms and third is digital content if we talk about technology per se we include three things first is the website the video streamings and the ebooks so if uh, as a teacher or as a person who comes from the education domain if i have to give some additional material to my learners i'll be leveraging ebooks i can leverage website i can leverage youtube videos so these are would all enable my uh, you know interaction with the learners if i talk about platforms social media somebody says that okay can you leverage social media to enhance learning yes there are many institutes or there are many teachers or facilitators who create social who create facebook pages and facebook pages they post questions and the learners can come together and discuss so it all depends on how creative you can think second is content management system if i talk about wordpress if i talk about moodle they all come under content management system and uh, my colleague diljit will talk in detail about content management system and learning management system and if we talk about learning management system so these are the three platforms the edx platform imbx platform and the swayam platform which at imb we leverage the same digital content if i talk about digital content that as professor vasanthi has mentioned in her presentation that video podcast case study discussion forum and interviews so all these are the various forms of digital content which we leverage while creating our courses so is synchronous learning same as face to face learning so people have already responded and the 67% have said that you know yes synchronous learning is same as face to face learning and 33% people have said no so at this stage i would like to pause and ask that uh, why have you all responded saying that synchronous learning is same as face to face learning anyone please unmute yourself and talk anyone why do you think that synchronous learning is same as face to face learning i see the percentage is uh, you know now changing many people are saying false pooja please unmute yourself and talk 
Yeah, I feel they both are same uh, as uh, the delivery of the content is there and the participation of, of the audience is also equally uh, present. So, yeah. Okay, do you think that the participation is same, whether a teacher is taking a class in, uh, you know, face-to-face -face or doing it via Zoom? Because many uh, of you are not participating. <laughs> Well, it depends upon how interesting the class is and how engaging it is. If we add a lot of activities like the poll that you did, uh, probably people are not able to understand how to, you know, vote or how the Zoom works uh, because it is different on system and the mobile. So I think that is one challenge that people are facing to uh, vote on your polls. If you can educate a little about that and um, uh, from my experience, if I make my online session very interesting with full of energy, a lot of questions, a lot of uh, asking questions, not just lecturing, it becomes very interesting. And the main point is sometimes I, if a student raised the question, I need not answer the fellows or, you know, other students, they respond to it. So it makes like, it's just not one teacher, there are multiple teachers and it is very interesting. Thanks. Thanks, Pooja. And thanks for this valid feedback. So all the learners who are facing challenge in accessing Mentimeter, uh, simple days instruction on the top of the screen share, please go to www.menti.com, key in the code 74113390, and you will be able to get the questions on screen and start responding. Is there any question at this stage regarding how to access Menti? We'll be more than happy to first uh, handle that and then move forward. So all of you are muted. If you raise hand, we'll unmute you and then you can ask your questions. Fine, let's move forward. So as Professor Vasanthi has already mentioned, you know, that synchronous learning, it allows our students to engage with the class material. And the only like currently what we are doing, leveraging Zoom meetings. So this is synchronous learning. So if somebody asks me that, okay, how do I remember, you know, if somebody asks me what is synchronous, asynchronous for me as a learner, it becomes a bit confusing. So there are some keywords. You can relate it to real time, live streaming or virtual learning. So all these are keywords which are equivalent to synchronous learning. So what are the tools which are available for synchronous learning? We have Google Teams, uh, we have Google Meet, Teams, Hangout, Zoom, WebEx. There are many people who leverage WhatsApp videos. It is also synchronous learning. Like if they have a small group project and all come together and they are on a WhatsApp video, that is also a synchronous learning. So what are the positive advantages of synchronous learning? As rightly mentioned by Pooja, you know, it enhances the engagement, right? It all depends on how effectively you can use the tools available. And uh, we get immediate response, right? Like you can see, you know, with the voting tabs were changing, the responses were changing, and it is very dynamic. And you have an opportunity to directly communicate with your facilitator or with your learner. So what is the greatest con? Like uh, we faced in our previous session, strong internet connection, Professor Asanti, just the bandwidth was low, so it was fluctuating. So, uh, you know, it somehow breaks the you know focus of the learners in case there is a, some problem or some issue with the bandwidth connection so if i ask then what is asynchronous learning oh good i'm glad that many people are responding on menti now uh, i just posted a question is sharing a pre-recorded video with learners a form of asynchronous learning true exactly yes so because asynchronous learning has different modalities and sharing a pre-recorded video is also a form of asynchronous learning because you need not be in real time. You can always share your videos, you can share your PDFs, you can share your discussion forum question beforehand and learners can log in uh, on the LMS or the CMS which you are providing. So as I've already talked about, you know, that uh, the tools which we can use for asynchronous learning is LMS and CMS. And the greatest advantage of asynchronous learning is flexible and self-paced. For example, if we are supposed to launch a program for uh, corporate partnerships, then we see that, you know, learners are working from 10 to 5. And if I, you know, tell them that, okay, today is a self-assessment, which is open, today is an assessment, which is open for two hours, they'll not be able to do it, right? So whenever we design a course, we always, you know, have to understand the background of the learner, 
and in what ways we can facilitate the learner to complete the journey. So, the, so now blended learning, asynchronous learning, or live learning, these are all the terms which we are using. And if somebody asks me, you know, what is hybrid learning? Then if you can see on a continuum, one side is online learning, the other is traditional, traditional learning. Hybrid or blended learning tries to use the best of both the worlds, right? And as mentioned by Rowai and Jordan in 2004, it was a very famous research paper by Rowai and Jordan in 2004, in which they said, you know, hybrid of classroom and online learning, you know, in, in which you are leveraging both face-to-face -face contact as well as online content. To exemplify, we can say that we have recently launched a program for a certificate in hospital management in which we have designed the course in such a way that the opening session, the learners are supposed to come to campus. Then we open up the MOOC courses for them. In between, we will leverage the web, uh, web content in which there will be a live session with the faculty concerned. And then for the Q&A session, they are again coming back to campus. So this is a perfect example of how we are leveraging blended learning. So if I may ask, or if I may say, what is the strength of blended learning? The first and the foremost strength of blended learning is that we have a control over the curriculum design. We can design the entire program or the course per se as, uh, as per the needs of my learners. So that is the biggest freedom which we get when we are leveraging blended learning. So the delivery, the evaluation, we have control over all these important key components of learning. Second thing is leveraging external expertise. What do we mean by leveraging external expertise? When we are doing a blended learning course, like I recently exemplified in our uh, hospital management program, we are calling a lot of expert talks. We have embedded, for example, a learner has finished a course in operations management. So we have invited an expert from a hospital who was the head of operations so that they understand what is the practical aspect or whatever theories I have learned during my operation management course, how do I deploy those theories in action? And uh, the third of strength of blended learning is the virtual teaching collaborator. If I talk about which virtual teaching collaborator, we as PRAs or RAs, do a lot of hand holding for the learners. We hold even hold office virtual office hours in which our learners can log in at any time, any time of the day. We tell them, you know, from Monday to Friday, we are available from 10 to 5. Please log in. If you have any issues regarding the course, be it related to content or be it related to a technology, we are there to assist you. So what is the benefits of blended learning? First and foremost, it is very learner-centered or faculty-facilitated. So it is an advantage to both faculty as well as the learner. It is flexible for both student and faculty because, you know, whether I'm standing in front of a movie hall or when I'm waiting at a restaurant for my friend, if I have, uh, you know, my digital devices and a good connection, I can just, you know, uh, sit and take my course at, the, at that time. Simultaneously, we can either do it time-paced or self-paced. The second benefit of blended learning is that it improves a lot of pedagogy. So moving ahead with the presentation, we will show you how we develop courses here. What are the various pedagogy tools which we are leveraging to develop our online course? And we have a very good mechanism of feedback and evaluation. For example, uh, if we have a video on benefits of prioritization, at the moment the video ends, there is a question which pops up. Do you find this video relevant? And the learner is supposed to pause and give us feedback. So we accumulate those feedback over a point of time and then feed it back into the course designing so that we can improve the quality of our courses. So benefits of blended learning, we all, available, we all know that you know, it improves access to the course materials. We have a lot of uh, opportunities to collaborate and co-evolve. And when we talk about uh, online learning, social engagement is a very, very key tool of online or blended learning. And co-involved in the sense that, you know, for example, if I have given a group project to my learners, so they are supposed to collaborate, they will think, they will brainstorm, and then they will, uh, they will co-work on the project and then probably present back to us. Resource magnifying, uh, it fills faculty skill gaps. For example, if as a teacher or a facilitator, I know that, okay, uh, marketing is my strength, but um, I'm not sure of, you know, how to teach digital marketing because that is a very new area then probably I can, you know, search some YouTube videos 
or I can search some existing course on Swayam or NPTEL. And then probably I can share that to my learners, you know, that please go through these video content and then probably we can have a discussion in class. And uh, the final benefit of blended learning is that it matches border strengths in technology and society. So now coming to the action point, how we as educators design our blended learning course. So the starting point, as I mentioned, is that you first, the starting point for designing any blended learning course is that you understand your learners. For example, I'm preparing a course on basics of statistics. Then I should know that, okay, I'll be offering this course to somebody who has done, you know, irrespective of any background. Then probably I will have to start my course with mean, median mode, then go to standard deviation, then go to pie charts and other various forms. So, but until unless I understand my learners, I'll not be able to design a course which is beneficial for them. So starting point is always understanding the prerequisite of the learners. If you see the increasing trend of online, online learning, you can very well see, you know, that how the number of total number of learners and total number of enrollments is increasing over the years. And thanks to pandemic for giving us those numbers, pandemic has a very greater role of increasing trend in online learning. And uh, the moment I have put this data is that we know that, you know, India is, uh, is among the top 10 countries where online learners are coming from. So people are really looking forward for online learning. And we, if, and we, if as educators are able to deliver that, nothing like that. So before we deploy or we start with our uh, uh, you know, starting point of designing any blended learning course, there are three set of questions which you should ask. What content should be created? Before that, you should ask who, for whom am I creating this content? Then what content should be created? What time should be spent on, right? For example, which skills and concepts, you know, will speed up the self-learning of the learners? What is the best use of the time? For example, I can decide that, okay, if I'm talking about basics of marketing, then probably, you know, uh, I need not record a video on the same. I can simply put up the definition as a text. And then probably I can, uh, and I can you know, get into a conversation with my learners. What are the four P's of marketing? Or what are the eight P's of marketing? So as a, as a facilitator, I need to decide you know, how best to use my time. So while you're designing your blended learning course, there should be three focus areas. First is the resource scoping. Second is instruction designing, and third is pedagogy. While I talk about resource scoping, first you're supposed to see that what are the available facilities in your institution? Is your institute ready to deploy, you know, or facilitate your blended learning course? Second is that whether you are personally competent to do that, or whether you have to, you know, go through some training process, which would uh, enhance your skills. And third is that whether you have technology infrastructure in your system or not. If I talk about instructional designing, your key focus area should be my courses should be learner centered. My courses should be knowledge centered and how I can uh, leverage community centered. Okay, the, the majority of the my focus in today's uh, presentation would be on how we are developing online courses. And before we move ahead to the practical aspect of what are the various ways in which we are leveraging pedagogy, if there are any questions, uh, I'll be more than happy to take. Please raise your hands or use the chat window to ask your questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So there's a question on YouTube uh, by Pallavi that uh, is there any requirements for professional competency to create these courses? I would not say professional competency, but I would say that uh, it's good if you are trained and if you understand that what are the various pedagogies and how well you can leverage these pedagogies. So first and the foremost, uh, there is another question. Is there any parameter to post my educational YouTube videos on YouTube? Okay, okay. So I was just starting with, uh, you know, how do we leverage videos at IMBX? So probably I'll answer your question at that hour. So uh, if you see the length of the video, which is displayed on screen is 0 0.53 seconds. So at IMBX, we make sure that none of our videos cross limit of six minutes because as it is well validated by research studies that the, the focus of learner engagement as far as leveraging the video content is concerned is not more than six minutes. So uh, if you want to effectively use uh, videos, make sure that your videos are short, uh, do a proper planning and uh, you know make sure that you really cover those contents in videos which cannot be covered by any other pedagogical aspect. For example, if there's, it doesn't make sense if you're talking or uh, defining uh, a definition, right? It's as good as putting up a PDF or uh, uh, any, uh, any other medium. So these are comic strips, which we leverage to a great extent and which if you can see, you know, that then there are various tools like Canva or even you can use, uh, I, have you, I have made this comic strip using PowerPoint presentation. So you can leverage comic strips in which, you know, you, this, this is just a beginning of, you know, thought provoking uh, thought in minds of learners that, okay, the moment you see this comic strip, what comes to your mind? This was the starting point of our course on people management. Third is audio podcast. Like Prof. Savasanti has mentioned, we leverage a lot of audio podcasts because sometimes, you know, as learners, we just need to listen. Or as faculty, if you see, you know, that you have already finished your recording and uh, you have already, the, the videos have been churned out very well. And while you're reviewing your course, you feel that there are bridges or there are gaps which, which are, you know, still not plugged in. Then you can also leverage audio podcasts in that case. Discussion forum. So when we are designing any online course or any blended learning course, discussion forum play, plays a very crucial role because that is the platform which brings our learners together. So if you talk about social learning, so a lot of social learning is happening while you are initiating or building conversations. So if you see the number of responses which we get on discussion forum is like 462, 572. So people, the moment you put some thought provoking discussion forum questions, you will get responses from learners. And the second important thing is the intervention of the faculty at regular time intervals as far as the content is concerned. So even if you see, you know, that Professor Vasanti has also already replied on the discussion forum. So these are the various, you know, nitty gritties or various interventions which we do to enhance learner engagement. Additional resources. In addition to the video content, the podcast content, the discussion forum questions, you can also leverage additional resources. For example, you can give some additional reading links. You can give the course handouts. Course handouts are nothing, just the summary of whatever the video lectures have been captured. Video links. Study plan. The moment a person is sitting in class and uh, the moment they enroll for a program, they get a brochure, detailed brochure, they get the entire syllabus. They know that, okay, for example, a topic is on uh, understanding human behavior. There'll be three sessions scheduled for one and, a, one and a half hours. But what happens when you're doing an online course? The learner is equally clueless. So it is a good practice to create a detailed study plan for the learners and give to them beforehand so that a learner knows that, that okay, for example, in week one, there are 10 MCQs, which I'm supposed to do. There are three re reading materials, which is there. There are two interviews, which I have to watch. So it becomes very easy for a learner to, you know, deploy their time or divide their time accordingly. Self-assessment. Self-assessment is a worry. For example, if you specifically self-assessment can be leveraged while you're offering a course on soft skill. 
for example we uh, we developed a course on people management and the starting point of the course was we wanted to understand that how a particular uh, learner is uh, you know understanding what is your understanding of people manager how do you rate yourself as a good people manager things to ponder so these are the small things which we you know do in between to bring the to break the monotony for example you know problem centered support from a peer can strengthen peer relationship quickly and deeply right so uh, the the key takeaway for me as a learner is that you know i should my focus should always be on the problem assessment in digital learning if i talk about the various ways in which we can assess uh, our learners is like the common problem type we all you you know leverage mcqs trues and false drag and drop numerical input text input and if we talk about the open response assessment we have peer assessment staff assessment and self assessment if i talk about peer assessment what does it means to me is that uh, for example i have a group of 75 learners in my class and i tell them a question you know that uh, interview a first time manager and while interviewing the first time manager uh, put down the challenges which he or she faced during her first interaction or first few days in office so the moment i put this question and then i tell my learners you know that you will be assessed by their peers so at the moment i submit my response i will get a pop up you know in order that your response should be assessed please please correct response of two of your peers so until unless i evaluate what my peers have submitted my response would not be evaluated the second form of open response assessment is staff assessment in which the learners will submit it to us and the staff or the faculty would assess the learners the third is self assessment in which basically we leverage when we do a lot of reflection assignment right for example i want learners to think you know thou na that you have completed your uh, module on being an effective people manager what were your five key takeaways so please key in your responses and uh, send us the same so if i talk about what is uh, active learning in a digital space have you have seen that you know we have uh, talked about the various pedagogy which we leverage at imbx to develop our online courses be it videos be it podcasts be it discussion forum questions be it self assessment be it our uh, assessment questions the moment you are building a sound pedagogy your learners will surely you know have a great take away from the courses which you are offering second is building conversations the moment you are giving space to learners to you know to come together uh, involve them into group projects or uh, you know encourage them to post a discussion forum they would certainly finish up the courses which you are offering the third is proactive and responsive behavior for example if i see my learner has posted a query on discussion forum and it's been two days three days four days that you know we as uh, the digital learning team have not answered the learners will stop posting on the discussion forum because they know that nobody is responding so while you are offering a course on digital space how ready your team is or how ready the faculty is to take up those questions that is a very key determining factor as far as the success of your course is concerned self reflection build in a lot of self reflection so that because in classroom it is very very easy you know that while i'm interacting with 75 students it would be very easy for me to you know pick any one of them and ask you know what is your key take away what was your key take away while i was taking a session on motivation what is your key take away in today's session on prioritization but the moment it is digital it is very very difficult you will not be able to you know leverage self reflection and final is self motivation the learners have to be motivated to complete their courses otherwise whatever the mechanisms we put in place will not work so it's open for uh, q and a you can use the same menti.com to post in your questions and they will come up on the screen please use www.menti.com and the code is 7411390 to queen your questions
any questions from YouTube? There's a question on YouTube that what is the eligibility to create a course in SWAM? So uh, there are no eligibility to create a course in SWAM. Your institute is uh, supposed to get in touch with the national coordinators. For example, I am Bangalore is the national coordinator for management courses. So please get in touch with us. We will uh, let you know the other formalities. What is the pedagogy for practical subjects? Can you please uh, elaborate on what do you mean by practical subjects? Because for me, even people management is a practical subject. I think they are asking, how do you do it for chemistry, or science labs? Okay, so for uh, two, uh, so the best pedagogy for practical subject is that you incorporate or collaborate a lot of virtual labs so that the learners can get on hands-on experience while doing going through the course. So there's a question on what is the pedagogy to teach long novels? For example, we have a course uh, by Professor Man, uh, Mani Kutti on uh, leadership through literature. So what he did is that, you know, he picked up a book, he made a summary of the book, he built up the questions around it, and then he delivered. So he had covered almost six to seven books while teaching leadership through literature. And the course is very well uh, available on Swayam. Uh, there's a question, is it, is it important to make video in six minutes? For mathematics, it is difficult to complete a topic or problem in six minutes. Uh, very rightly said uh, Nabjyoti Bhattachari. Uh, even if here, for example, a professor is teaching a core concept on artificial intelligence, or they are demonstrating, you know, some mathematical equation. We do not encourage the professor to stop the video at that hour, even if the video continues for 15 minutes. The best we can do is that, you know, you can divide it, you can stop it at a leverage break, probable uh, logical break, and divide it into part one, part two of the video so that the learners, you know, it's not too monotonous for them. And they know that, you know, the, the professor has covered the theory part of it in first video, and they will demonstrate the practical part in the second video. Thank you. Can you suggest an effective tool for podcast? Use your mobile phones. You can you you can easily put on your voice recorder and and uh, you know capture your your podcast and just plug in where and wherever you want. And and you can put it none that in YouTube. Accounting mathematics subjects. Okay. Can you suggest an effective tool for podcast? Ma'am, how can we apply for chemistry subjects to make it easy? Okay. So what do you want to make easy in chemistry subject? If you're talking about, for example, if I have to teach my students periodic table, how do I make it easy for my learners? It all depends, you know, give them interactive questions, give them some quizzes and build around it. How to be secure in online teaching platform when it comes to job security, okay? How to be secure in an online teaching platform when it comes to job security? Do you think that online teaching will take away your jobs? It will not. The blended learning or the online teaching is always, you know, uh, to facilitate or to improve the standards of teaching or to enhance learner engagement. So don't think, you know, that online teaching will take away your jobs and it would be an insecure market for you to discover.
Sapi Bhasha has asked, what are some of the best tools for evaluation, best tools for assessment? Okay, uh, because when, if you are taking the help of any learning management system, the learning management system has an inbuilt uh, capability to leverage various assessment tools, whether it is MCQ, whether it is drag and drop, or whether it is, uh, you know, open assessment or staff assessment. So it all depends on whether you are, which LMS you are leveraging to develop your course. <clears throat> Yes, Dr. Ashutosh. Yes, ma'am. Actually, I would like to ask, as you said, that uh, the video should be of six minutes, right? And I am using my YouTube channel for several educational programs. But I am making the video, videos of around about 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and some of the videos are, are of 40 minutes. So is there any set uh, standard to make these videos of only six minutes or five minutes? Is there anything like that? Uh, Dr. Ashutosh, there is no set standard, uh, but you should okay. always see the data. YouTube always gives you the number of views, you know, your learners have watched. That will give you, yeah. uh, you know, a clear uh, indication of what you are doing, whether it is correct or whether it is not correct. Right. For example, okay. if you see the learners say, you know, the, the video length is too much for me. Can you please break it down into two smaller videos? Okay. Because as a learner, uh, if for example, if I ask you how many times you have watched a learning video, not Netflixing or, you know, watching Prime Video, any learning hmm. uh, video for more than 30 minutes, we, okay, we right. ourselves will not do that. So how can we expect hmm. our learners to watch a learning video for more than 30 minutes? Yeah, naturally, naturally. Okay, so that is better to make a video of six minutes or maximum 10 minutes. So our learner will be able to focus on it. Exactly. Yes. Make smaller chunks yes. of videos so that they can, you know, uh, it's easier for them to watch, you know, for example, if you're explaining a concept on uh, basics of delegation, if there are six mm. ways in which I can, you know, uh, streamline the delegation process, as far as people managing is concerned, then probably a 50 seconds video on the first topic, a one minute video on the second topic. So for it, it will be very easy for the learner to also understand. Okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Is it better to provide contents through YouTube video and discuss any confusion? There's a question on discussion forum. Is it better to provide content through YouTube videos and discuss any confusion in face-to-face -face conversation in class? Because I have a doubt with whether assessment tool works effectively. Yeah, that's that's a very good uh, way to leverage online learning. That you can, uh, you know, instead of uh, taking the time in class, you can just uh, send out the links to your learners that you know this is uh, this is the pre-read for today's class. So please make sure that the moment you enter the class, you have gone through the videos. And then probably you can start the conversation on, you know, how the video ended. And that would be a good, uh, you know, uh, brainstormer for the, for the class itself. So I think there are no uh, follow-up questions. So thank you so much for sparing your time and joining this session. And give us a break of two, three minutes, and then probably my colleague Diljit will start his session. Thank you.
Hi, uh, I think uh, it was a wonderful session. Uh, thank you, Vijaya, uh, on taking us uh, through the session on uh, pedagogy. Uh, I think it, uh, the idea was us to flow from Professor actually introducing the entire online ecosystem and then Vijaya actually taking the session on the pedagogy, how the course content and things like that are happening. And the third session is kind of the final session today. So we, I will be more focusing on uh, technology in classroom. Uh, uh, I've, uh, my name is Diljit. I've spent uh, my almost 12 years in online learning and e-learning field. And it's just amazing to see how how things have evolved in the last 10 to 12 years. And things have been, uh, in the last two years, especially things have changed tremendously. Uh, and the languages that we speak about technology has uh, really changed, especially in terms of uh, online education. Uh, you would have also seen like uh, in the last two years, a lot of edtech players, everybody want, I, I'm sure you would have also attended meetings where people really coming and saying that uh, we want to, uh, we have invented an L LMS, we, you put it in our platform and it is going to change the way things are going to happen. So I would like to just maybe uh, take some time to go through, uh, and we have also got some questions regarding LMS, CMS and things like that. So we'll be covering all this uh, on the way. So Meanwhile, we tend to use uh, uh, terminologies, so I will try and avoid terminologies. So I've kept, uh, we have kept it really simple. So, but if there is any questions, please feel free to put it on chat, and we'll be uh, kind of taking up. I'll be uh, Vijay is anyway in, uh, here, and she'll be kind of pinging me on the questions. As Vijay used the Mentimeter, we'll be continuing to use the Mentimeter. But just to be sure that the code has changed because we are using an another Menti. So if you have not yet logged into your Mentimeter, please do at menti.com and use the code 401489. You can either use your mobile phone or the computer. Just go to menti.com and use the code so that you'll be able to kind of, uh, we are hoping to keep a lot of this a bit really interactive. Uh, uh, so you, we are going to ask you a few questions regarding the same. So if you can log into Menti, uh, as of now, there is no questions, but you will be uh, getting a bit more questions. So I just want to start with uh, the first slide uh, where this was his famous quote in 1922, where it says, I believe that the motion pictures is designed to revolutionize our education system. Like this was Thomas Edison, right? So uh, I, I'm just looking back on uh, 1922. I mean, when you look at like, even like almost 100 years before, uh, when they said that the television is going to really revolutionize way the, the way education system have gone. Uh, if we look back and see how much television has contributed to education, definitely it has. But I think the majority of the uh, uh, technology was kind of, deviated to the entertainment purpose and the we kind of missed out the education part of the entire uh, scenario where uh, the motion pictures was going to design and the television was going to change i just wanted to go a bit further saying that when you look at any technology it's really interesting right uh, so it started with television saying that uh, we could actually deliver long distance content from uh, from a uh, different place and People could potentially sit in a classroom and listen to the content. And then came the radio. And it was, it was predicted that we could use the uh, uh, faculty from a distant places and you can actually deliver lecture to mass audience using radio technology. And I, uh, of course, these technologies was tried out. I, I don't know whether if, if you know, they know had a channel which actually delivered online content. But... In a way, these were all technologies which 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 is just coming and going. For example, look at uh, days when I, I am sure many of you would relate when you got your first computer and uh, we were told that those CDs that we got would really revolutionize the way we did education and deliver the content, right? So we were able to, I, I remember getting few CDs and actually putting it and not really using much. Uh, so, and and it kept on improving like that from CDs to internet connectivity. 
So people said, oh, you have internet. No, no, none of the information is withhold. We can actually go and get uh, content online. Just go to the internet and just get the content. And from that, uh, more and more, the YouTube, the MOOCs revolution came in 2015 and kind of slided away uh, towards the end of 2020. And now we are more talking about live classrooms and things like that. And there are some things in future, which is more like the simulation and the metaverse. What I wanted to kind of... Uh, uh, bring the point is that technology has always uh, kind of uh, uh, predicted that it will kind of revolutionize the education system and uh, many technologies kind of promise that but eventually when you see the question is uh, it's it's kind of it's a question is between is it revolution or evolution right uh, basically, revolution means that you are completely turning around the way education is conducted. And But what we eventually see is the technology has kept evolving, usually a bit further than what actually the education could be catch up. When you look at all this technology and look back and say, how do we still conduct our teaching and learning programs? It would boil back to maybe we use, I mean, I, I, I we work with a lot of uh, places where they we, we see how much technology do they use, right? So you really see even for using a PowerPoint in their teaching methodology is kind of a long way to go uh, in many places. So when we look back, the technology, have it really revolutionized the education industry? No, but have the evolution really pushed how the education is conducted? Yes. So what we could, uh, what in IMB we kind of try and uh, uh, boil down to this question is there are technologies available, but we really want to look at saying that what technology can be used right now to kind of build a learning experience that the students want to kind of uh, experience. So starting with that question, we would be able to kind of uh, not really start with saying that, okay, what is the technology available and how can we use it? And say it a bit reverse saying that what do we want to really achieve as a teacher? So that's where we feel that the teacher or the faculty members play a very crucial learn role in actually uh, taking this technology to the students and creating an environment of learning. Right? So, I mean, we had this curious question. Uh, if you could potentially spend some time uh, we wanted to know, I mean, we really conduct faculty development workshops and uh, uh, and we ask this question, uh, how many of you have been teaching actually before pandemic? Oh, it's quite surprising and, and, and the group seems to be quite different here because we usually get a different sense here. So it's surprising that, okay, okay, the graphs are a bit going up almost 50 any we have got 94 people here and we have got like 15 people participating if anybody of you have trouble with mentimeter please go to menti.com and please enter that code if you are using a computer you can even use your phones not a problem 401489 is the code uh we really want to see, okay, it's quite 50-50, quite surprising uh, because unlike the last faculty development workshop that we did and we had almost 100 participants and uh, we had almost like four people or five people actually teaching online uh, and the majority of them was actually uh, uh, teaching face-to-face. -face. Uh, we have a much empowered online teaching group in this uh, uh, group here. So that's really great. Uh, I'll give maybe like 30 more seconds to kind of see if there are other, if still it balances out. Okay. I'm, I'm re really curious to know like how you were teaching online. Is it actually using fully, fully online or actually uh, using technology, if you can put it in the chat, that will be quite interesting for us to kind of also understand before pandemic, how did you use the technology to teach online, right? Okay, so I take it 50-50, still the votes keeps coming. How many of them? Uh, oh, the numbers have gone up. 
So we have 33 people actually voting and still counting. Uh, I'll just keep it at that. I will go to the next slide. And also we want to know during pandemic. Uh, uh, it's This is before pandemic and just wanted to know during pandemic, uh, how have you been doing? Right? Oh, okay. It's quite interesting. Okay. Okay, so that seems to be kind of an obvious kind of thing that uh, during pandemic, I think we have been uh, kind of uh, teaching online. Okay. All right. All right, I'll, I will wait for like a few seconds more because we had last 25 people. I don't Okay, some of you have not been teaching online. So it's quite interesting, right? I mean, before pandemic, the number of people who thought online was quite lesser compared to actually uh, during the pandemic, I think we all got the taste of uh, uh, teaching online. I think many of us, are, and we kind of in e-learning industry, we say that the pandemic kind of became a catalyst for online education to become uh, become the phase of uh, the teaching, right? So the question is, uh, is online learning new? Or is it literally like, is it only because of the pandemic, the online teaching has been come? It Literally, it's not. Uh, uh, if you see the corporate industries, if you look at the learning and development division of any, any uh, companies, uh, they start, they have been using a, many of the courses and online teaching materials to kind of improve their productivity. I think one of my first jobs was to actually go sit with a corporate and say they had a PPT and the only objective was to they convert that PPT into an online video and they just put it and kind of do an assessment and see. So uh, online learning has not been new. It is it It has been there for a long time now the technology was also kind of evolving very gradually to it but the pandemic what what it did was to kind of push this entire agenda forward uh, even the even our ugc rules and the uh, education policies are now kind of changing where online learning has become a very integral part of uh, uh, what we do nowadays so that push is in the right direction and you can also see the uh, the students at the new generation are quite as professor vasanti was mentioning they are digital natives and they 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 are very comfortable with this kind of learning they can do 100 things at a time including the learning part so as we see we will see that the digital learning will become an integral part of uh, uh, part of what teaching and learning uh, development processes Oh, I covered what has changed. Uh, I want to touch upon this. Uh, we have been uh, thinking about uh, how we can actually practically do the change in this education uh, platform, right? So if you look at, uh, the as we mentioned, there were different terminologies that people use like e-learning, blended learning, online learning, digital learning, uh, technology-enabled learning. So... But as part of blended learning, one of the models which has been really proven and uh, been used very effectively is called uh, the flipped classroom model. Uh, some of you may be intuitively doing this model. It is not like uh, something very magical. But uh, the essence of the flipped classroom model is that uh, we could potentially deliver the theory subjects what you teach actually as a theory concepts online and when the when the students or the learner actually come to the session we will kind of uh, engage them in face to face using discussion uh, if i may give an example like if you want to teach somebody to actually be very good at presentation or a powerpoint presentation or or improving the presentation skill, if I may, uh, you would ask them, I mean, we don't want the uh, students to come to the uh, classroom 
actually then you sit and show them how the PowerPoint works or PPT works or how slides works or how animation works rather than doing that in the class you actually maybe give them a list of YouTube videos as a tutorial or give a course from somewhere that is available for the faculty to uh, for the students to take and then they come to the face-to-face -face session you would more focus on maybe ask them to make a presentation on something or ask them to demonstrate the feature that they have learned in the class. So like this, what you do is you really save a lot of time. Uh, actually, uh, you, you, especially you save a time because you, you, you don't have to deliver that same content in the class. And from a student point of view, it is, it is really amazing if they really want to learn they get their own time and pace. So we have been, I, I think, talking about this thing about personalization. How can students uh, learn at their own pace? Can can they can they learn at their any time and anywhere they want? I think when you adopt a flipped classroom model, it really enables the students to have that time and space for them to actually look at uh, how they want to do. For example. If you are giving videos of this PowerPoint presentation to the students, if some person may be able to get it at the first run, some may not be able to get it at the uh, first run. So they will be able to actually go, look back and repeat the class and really uh, understand the subject before coming to the uh, uh, session or the face-to-face -face session. So what you can do is uh, basically you could potentially leverage any platform. For example, uh, you could ask a student to uh, complete a Swayam course, which is actually available with uh, uh, even the IMB courses are available. Similarly, there are many courses which are available in the platform. You could potentially ask a student to either complete a course or you don't even have to sometimes complete a course. I think people think, uh, people th uh, talk a lot about this completion rate in an online environment. So we don't have to stick to whether people are actually completing the course in an, uh, like in a soy portal, you may want to leverage maybe like one module or one class or one video from the soy portal and say that uh, students, please watch this before coming onto the, uh, onto the face to face session so that we can do the discussion. So what we want to kind of uh, convey the message is that the content is available. I'm sorry, is just one example I wanted to share. There are multiple platforms. You can also potentially use your own uh, lectures. That I I I hear that many of you are using YouTube uh, YouTube as a channel to kind of put the video content in the channel and then share it. You could potentially use the Swayam course. Or you could use your own recordings that you put it in the YouTube channel and share it with your students. Or you could even use the videos which are already available in YouTube and leverage that for learning purposes. And then when they actually come to the face-to-face -face session, you can, you, can, you can more engage the students with discussions, ask them to make presentations so that that will be really good, right? In, in, in the case of presentation skills, I would request my uh, students to come and actually present what they have learned or you make them into four or five groups and two, three uh, groups present in various topics so that the, there is also a, an opportunity for the peers to engage and learn from each other. So these are the uh, uh, bit of methods that we can think of using as part of the flipped learning model. Uh, if there are any questions till now on flipped learning model and things like that, we would be happy to kind of take a few of them class in the classroom what are the tools required yeah how can i take theory classes online in classroom what are the tools required for that uh Rejipta has a question on this so uh, i mean that's the same thing that i wanted to say that uh, if you are able to kind of move the theory part online and uh, bring the students offline for more discussion I think that would really add value in terms of how you will use uh, kind of technology within uh, within the space, right? Or if you are able to record your theory or uh, many of the teachers now currently say that I have all the Zoom recordings that I did during the pandemic. Can I leverage that? Definitely, you should be able to leverage that uh, Zoom recording. Maybe as Vijaya was pointing out, you may want to cut out the pieces that are important and put it 
rather than putting this whole one hour session online but that really helps uh, kind of using some of the recordings that you have already done maybe you could leverage it to kind of cut and share it with the students to teach uh, some of the classes if there is any other questions if you can quickly put on the chat uh, regarding flip learning and how technology has evolved uh, otherwise we will kind of move forward uh, with this i hope you will be able to use swayam portal or, uh, or or the youtube channel kind of uh, to see how you can kind of flip your model i mean it's the simplest way of kind of adapting the technology in the classroom you don't have to even create your own videos you can potentially leverage the videos that are all already available or the courses that are already available uh, you may want to look at the course and say this module is really interesting in finance please go and take it and come and we can discuss that topic further right okay i just want i mean if you can take your menti again if your mobile phones uh, if you can just highlight i mean let's let's all, we usually think it from uh, the teacher's point of view so we wanted to kind of think from a student point of view uh, what are all the kind of key advantages that uh, uh, of using these kind of models uh, in the classroom what do you think would be the key advantage of using technology in classroom maybe like flipped model you may want to type one or one word or something uh, interesting any words okay thanks for that i mean it's really nice so we will be able to engage the students that's a very important point what we also do is to kind of uh, uh, the, the way we can try and engage is when when actually student comes and there is also a problem huh? some students may not actually uh, kind of uh, look at the session but you could potentially use various methods to kind of talk to them and try and understand whether actually they have learned or not i think yeah student gets to save a lot of time uh, you see there are any 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 class you take there are students who actually do uh, follow it well and they get bored in the class or don't understand and then kind of uh, uh, i mean if you look, if you really look at a classroom you will have a bell curve where one session of the students are really fast and the other session of the students are really kind of slow and the middle ones i think when you use a flipped model you will get a leverage to kind of uh, uh, for the students to learn on their own and also use their own pace so it also potentially saves a lot of time for the teachers to uh, during the class because the entire thing is kind of a self paced uh, thing in the classroom no travel i think i i, we, I mean this uh, session is one of the biggest example right imagine bringing 150 people into one place from various part of the country i think no travel oh wow i mean i'm getting amazing uh, world cloud here learn with fun that's amazing uh, thanks for that can engage even a weaker student yes that's what we wanted to say the bell curve where even the weaker student gets the control uh, the pace otherwise I, i i can imagine that within the class you will be sitting and the lecture is moving forward and the person has not got it and then really struggling to kind of keep up with the thing deeper knowledge wow collaboration with peers i think you 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 are like uh, you guys are magical i think uh, you uh, covering almost all the all the things that we can think of quick polls yeah i think the poll also gives a lot of uh, uh, lo lot of uh, flexibility in terms of how we can do it oh i'm not able to catch up
Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, Mr. Diljeet, we can't hear you. The audio is missing. Yeah. So this is the most practical. Uh, so we had to change the mic. Uh, that's a delay. Sorry for that. Uh, and this is a part of the challenge that we have been talking about saying that uh, when you're using technology, some, some things keeps coming up. But uh, I, I will keep this at this slide. I think people have got enough advantages of using technology in class. I think uh, the highlight being engaging, interactive, and also like bunch of things like save time, rich content, involved, individualized learning, innovative approaches. Wow. Okay. Better understanding bring students together. I think it just covers the whole spectrum of things. Uh, I mean, it's great that uh, we are able to think it from a student point of view, the advantages that we can get by uh, leveraging a flipped classroom model, right? Uh, I, we don't want to stick just with the, I think uh, the, I, can, I can see that people are just continuing to vote here. I will move to the next slide. I also see that people, uh, they can be focused and focus. I think it, uh, that's get going on repeating. We cannot just stick with what are the advantages. Uh, as anything, there are also challenges faced while teaching online. So here we want to kind of uh, focus on the teacher point of view. Uh, it's been not easy to teach online. Uh, we have been talking with a lot of teachers. So it is... Uh, it has not been very easy to kind of also teach and engage. It has been one of the most difficult things. So not to kind of shower on it and see what are the challenges that, of course, I think one of the important challenges is the poor internet connectivity. Uh, but uh, if you look at the connectivity issue, like if you look, if you go back four years before, there was not even a 4G connection. And number of people who had mobile phones were completely less. I, I see that internet connectivity is one of the biggest challenges, but uh, things about technology like internet and connectivity is that these things get plugged very fast. If you actually look at uh, Tri's report, I mean, Tri actually gives reports every quarter, I think. I'm not really sure about the uh, frequency, but the number of people who are getting internet connectivity is increasing drastically. So basically this challenge is it will continue to remain, but I think that this challenge is plugging very fast in terms of connectivity and how how many people are able to oh, kind of go mid uh, this one. I would go a bit more on uh, other things rather than connectivity. Small groups are not effective. Okay, that's interesting that, uh, oh, I, I'm just curious to know why small groups are not effective in an online uh, teaching. Uh, keeping engagement is challenge, yes. I think definitely we agree. Uh, keeping engagement in an online uh, environment is very challenging. So that is why we really encourage uh, you to use, I mean, rather than, so what happens in a typical lecture, right? Uh, I, I remember me going uh, during the pandemic, uh, towards the end of the pandemic, we were going for a trek and uh, there was this group of students who were just walking with us and uh, they were uh, uh, periodically checking their mobiles. And we were asking, what were you doing? And they were attending online co courses while actually doing a trek. So it was quite interesting that uh, some of these online classes, I, at least they are not listening. They are logged in and kind of uh, being there and not really engaging. I think it's a very, very important things to consider that you need to, uh, the engagement becomes a very key part of any online uh, teaching and learning experience. What we have realized is uh, some simple things like a poll uh, really helps kind of uh, engage the students. Uh, second thing is, if you have a smaller group, uh, maybe like 20 or 30 as a usual class, you could even pull out students and ask them to make some presentation. That really, uh, and uh, you, you will see during this time that people will run away saying that their internet connectivity is bad. But still, I think you if you, if you bit pursue and identify the students and say, ask some questions and uh, kind of ask, follow up with that, I, it really helps. And the third one is if possible, if the connectivity is good enough, uh, we would 
we at least, uh, so it's possible in this area i'm sure in rural areas it would be quite difficult if they can on the video i think uh, uh, we have found that when you on the video the interaction and the engagement really improves but other other possibility is also saying that if uh, for example uh, they could potentially attend the uh, course here and ask them to record a video as a group or as an individual and ask them to share it over whatsapp uh, this is not from a, uh, we all do it from a teacher point of view, right? We all share the uh, learning materials or teaching materials that we did from a teacher to student point of view. What if we could reverse it and ask the students to kind of uh, uh, understand and share, maybe divide them into four or five groups and ask them to actually use their mobile phones or technology to kind of record the video lecture and send it back to us saying that, how can we uh, uh, send it back to teachers and teachers actually review the content that they have developed as a peer, you can use it to relevant. So there are a lot of things that you can do to kind of uh, overcome some of these challenges. Uh, that yeah. I would also, network issue seems to be the most prevailing uh, factor here um, to keep the audience retention time. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the thing that I was trying to share saying that how can you retain? some some engaging activities and spending some uh, interactive poll i think uh, would definitely help uh, yeah i think this yeah i mean we say that our biggest competition is uh, is the youtube channel which is near the tab so distraction is definitely one of the biggest challenges i think uh, while teaching online uh, because uh, okay Move the slide a bit. Okay, how do I scroll? Yeah. Oh, okay. There's lots coming in. Lack of tech savvy people, bandwidth. Okay, digital literacy. Okay, I think that's one of the challenges that we also see sometimes beginning. But what we have felt is that once you get on with it, they really take the help of the peer students to kind of get uh, uh, get away with it. Of course, and uh, another important factor I wanted to say is also this depends upon the age group of the participants, right? Uh, to engage, uh, um, I mean, it comes with different kind of challenges. Engaging a younger group of people, they are really digital literate, but for them to engage, they get distracted very easily. Maybe an older group of people, it's easier for them to sit in front of the classroom, but engagement becomes a bit more uh, challenging uh, with them. Okay, I mean, there are just enormous number of responses. Thanks a lot for being very uh, very proactive in the uh, in the discussion group uh, it uh, so uh, just to summarize uh, the whole thing i think the one of the most difficult part of the entire online teaching is network and internet and the bandwidth connectivity uh, what we personally feel is uh, within the next few years these uh, the connectivity issue is going to improve a lot and uh, hopefully we will have a bit more uh, 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 more connectivity where students are able to kind of engage with us more this one. And the second thing is about, of course, the unmotivated uh, students, students actually not focusing and distraction and things like that. We have shared some tools. If you have some ideas, I'm sure you, you are all teaching online. So if you are able to share some ideas on how, uh, how you are, as faculty members, you were able to use some of the engagement methods to kind of, uh, uh, create uh, engagement in class, we would be really happy to, because what we have found is each faculty has their own unique way of uh, uh, creating engagements and, and mostly depending upon the subject, they may have to tweak a bit in terms of how the engagement needs to be done, right? Because uh, a person uh, uh, teaching chemistry or a person teaching max has a completely, or a, uh, somebody teaching arts, have a different way of innovating within their class uh, on how they can do it in terms of somebody uh, somebody teaching arts somebody was sharing that uh, you could potentially watch a video and uh, and then ask them to actually make their own video but maybe that you cannot do that in a chemistry class so we would be very happy to kind of listen to some innovations that uh, everybody has done we all feel that uh, as professor was sharing what are all the things that we can share in terms of how the engagement uh, can be done, right? Oh, somebody mentioned too many tools. Okay, too many tools is always a problem. <laughs> I think uh, there are a lot of tools available in the market right now. 
for creating engagement and things like that i think we should stick to one or two tools that we that works for people uh, that can be used okay okay engagement is not possible if i cannot see my teacher okay i would really encourage at least when you are teaching uh, if you have the enough connectivity to on the video i think that is one simplest of things that we can do if the connectivity is good enough that we can uh, try and engage the participants right uh, first of all i want to thank everyone who has actively been participating in the uh, session i mean lot of ideas lot of thoughts uh, in terms of uh, what we can do in terms of uh, the key advantages for the students and the challenges that we are facing while teaching online right so uh, we were asked to i mean uh, one of the key things that uh, was mentioned is the thing of using a learning management system so uh, i think usually when you hear the word learning management system we use the short word lms it basically means learning management system or the other commonly used word is uh, cms uh, it's content management system right so i want you to think what is the key difference between an lms and a cms and uh, why do many of the institution oh i wish i had a mentee here i, I, I mean i felt that i would uh, i wanted to share it but uh, uh, it's okay if you can put that in chat we will be kind of looking at it so uh, a key difference between a learning management system and a content management system so let me give an example the open source examples of both an lms uh, is an uh, learning management system for example like canva is an lms blackboard is an lms the most used is the moodle which is an open source i think many of you will be familiar with it. and uh, open edx that's what we use within our institute which is called open edx these are all uh, learning management system that we can leverage to kind of uh, deliver the class i'll quickly differentiate the difference between an lms and a cms that's a most commonly kind of asked question uh, if you look at uh, cms it's more like a content management system so uh, content management system for example if i give drupal or wordpress or joomla these are all the examples of uh, the content management system so uh, to highlight what are the key differences and why uh, for a education environment we prefer to use a learning management system rather than a content management system is that in a content management system for example if you have looked at any website right so uh, imagine it as kind of a place where you can deliver content effectively for example uh in a wordpress you will be able to kind of share your blogs or design your own websites right or kind of put your uh, podcast in the system or uh, typically any website uh, any small and medium scale websites are built on a cms uh, system a content management system either built uh, open source like wordpress or it is built by some company okay but when you come to a learning management system it is it is a bit different from a content management system learning management system gives you the functionality to actually run an entire uh, online school that's what a learning i mean if you if i can just simplify it from the terminologies and just put it in a very sim, uh, lay person's term learning management system re really becomes an online school for you so if you can imagine your own uh the uh, colleges or uh, universities what are all the things that you have right you have got a, a administrative block offline so if you want to do the same kind of functionality online we use a learning management system where this entire administration of students how the students teachers uh, configure who is a teacher who is a student who is a, a manager so same thing you can leverage it on right in a sense in face to face you have something called a classroom right somebody go and lecture so similarly if you want to take it online you have a space where you can put all the classes in, right in a uh, face to face session you may have discussion right so you want a system which enables you to create uh, uh, administer discussions online 
so it becomes a you can actually activate a discussion forum in a learning management system and and activate a discussion forum so uh, to put it in a very simple it, it is a uh, technologically it's a bit more complicated than that in terms of administering it but to for for a for a uh, lay person to understand what is an lms you can think of a college and a school and various departments that uh, the school or the college has and if you want to leverage that and take the entire offline experience i'm not saying the similar way but the replicate the same kind of environment online the best way of doing it is using a learning management system uh if you have some questions uh, i mean uh, we can uh, use lot of things i mean uh, from a uh, uh, from an administrator point of view you can put your discussion forum class interactive sessions we have something called h5p where you can actually students to drag and drop things and really create interactions in the learning management system and okay i have a question here but we implement lms and cms under blended learning right okay so i mean uh, it's important right so how do you want to kind of use uh, leverage this technologies it is not like the cms cannot be used as a blended learning for if you want to just deliver a content right if you want to just show a video and just ask the students to go through the video systematically and come to your class you can leverage the cms also as part of the uh, delivery mechanism but if you want to go a bit more systematic and say oh i want to know where the student is how much the student has progressed the, have the student actually progressed in the classroom how much time have they spent in the uh, classroom for example in your face to face uh, college uh, college you will be able to know right how much the student has come so how would you want if you want to know that in an online environment if you use an lms it will give you a lot of analytics capacity where you know the student where are the students doing how much the students has progressed we call something called a learning path where you will be able to know where the students have progressed from point a to point b or point b to point c how much modules are there so you get a sense of where the students are at any point of time and the system actually enables you to kind of get all these reports uh, rather than you actually sitting and manually doing many of these things right so that's on the lms and cms uh we just wanted to quickly uh, also look at saying that have you used an lms before uh uh yes i see many of you have leverage i think uh, uh i can see that the moodle platform has been implemented in many colleges especially during the pandemic and even before pandemic uh what we have seen typically in many of the cases is that the the entire the the platform is there but the potential is used at a very minimal level for example maybe like 10 percentage of the capacity or the function of the platform is really leveraged to kind of deliver the uh, or use it for interactivity and things like that but i've see uh, it's it's quite nice to see that uh, many of you have been using uh, learning management system uh, uh, for their sessions uh, quite interesting we have 13 votes wait for a bit more to see if the numbers are matching out okay so that's great i think many of you have a learning management system available uh, for you maybe the next question is how can you leverage it a bit more kind of uh, to engage the students i think uh, we, we have uh, uh, okay somebody says no here okay that's fine sir i mean you you put it in the chat but that's fine a uh, few people uh, if your institutions are able to get a learning management system it really helps to kind of streamline uh, many of the uh, processes in the uh, uh, while teaching online it gives a leverage there is a bit of learning curve in terms of how to use it uh, but definitely it plays a very key role in uh, in this one but i see that majority at least 22 people have kind of shared their thoughts here uh, and we see that a uh, majority of the people have been uh, using a learning management system just leave it for few seconds more uh, i don't see any response okay 24 out of 80 people we have 24 people participating that's great 
give me few more okay great thanks a lot for the this one i would now i've shared few examples already uh so i was we were wondering why should we use lms now so i've covered it between the lms or if there is any other thought that uh, you have to share please do one is definitely administering the students online other thing is about you can create your video lectures third one is we discussed about the discussion forum you can create interactive activity to keep track of the learners profile that's great better organizations in class yes i mean you can organize the content and leverage it and use it later also that is one of the key advantages that we have found like how professor wasanthi was mentioning that she had her course set up and she is able to you i mean the, her team is able to kind of uh, leverage that course and run it again and again you don't need the faculty time the but the to be very frank the time that is involved by the faculty at the initial stage is quite high it kind of reduces later right so if you want if you are finding it difficulty in the beginning it is kind of the known fact that when you are going to teach online the time that you in, get involved in actually the development process is quite high and then eventually the time uh, kind of reduces uh, on the way learning anytime anywhere great i mean because you will have access to integrate technology yes i mean that's an important point somebody has mentioned it that you could potentially use other other two uh, technologies into the learning management system that's a very important point so for example you could have the youtube video embedded inside the learning management system so that what happens is otherwise what we are doing is all this technology are, are staying independently for example your youtube channel will may stay independently if you use a forum uh, some other technology for viewing quiz it is an independent thing but what learning management system helps you is to bring all this technology all these tools into one place somebody was telling the challenges of online learning was uh, too many tools so the learning management system actually enables you to kind of bring all these tools into one place and the beauty is you will be able to kind of get an analytics point of view how the students are progressing even if they use multiple tools the system itself will capture kind of thing yeah i think the most important thing is grading and record keeping that's amazing grading uh, there is a grade book feature which is available you don't have to manually do it so once the system generates grades i think uh, of what the grades the students have got how much have they attempted like even if you give a multiple choice question you can actually see how many attempts how many times have they done it wrong how many times have they got it right how many times have they uh, uh, made an attempt how how much time have they spent in the quiz so these kind of analytics also help us a great uh, help us a lot in terms of kind of improving uh, our uh, course content itself so if you are a faculty member and want to improve the content uh, you can use this data points a lot to kind of leverage and improve your content also to see that whether the quiz is kind of serving the purpose and things like that can teach more than the courses required by the college okay that's great uh, yeah i mean yeah there are some times where you want to deliver extra content and we don't have the time to do it in the face to face session this is not really learning management system but you can actually provide course content that uh, are not directly uh you can deliver in the face to face asking question being anonymous huh? this is an interesting thing yeah uh, i mean to be very frank uh, within the learning management system uh, we could potentially anonymize it but mostly most of the learning management system uh, they will be sharing their uh, credentials uh, online but uh, definitely i think that's something which you can leverage at, at least in discussion forum and okay yeah i think uh, one of the important thing is to re repeat the content like you can record and keep uh, content in the learning management system and you can eventually come to the next session and kind of repeat the whole thing uh, again and again yeah can evaluate students by quiz yeah i think another thing that we have found it very interesting is the quiz feature the multiple choice questions Uh, even though that's a very standard way of uh, teaching online uh, what we have found is uh, uh, multiple choice questions enables us to see if the participants have actually listened 
uh, to the content or not. So, for example, if you are giving a video and giving a series of multiple choice question, you kind of understand uh, from the students that uh, whether the person has actually listened to the video or not. So, I think quiz and automating the quiz uh, becomes a very key part of uh, this entire uh, process. Again, I think uh, everybody was very interactive. Uh, thanks for sharing. I hope uh, the concept of LMS and the CMS, the difference between the LMS and CMS is quite uh, clear now. Uh, if and we we were quite, I mean at least I was quite surprised to see that most of you have been using the learning management system. So uh, usually, typically in uh, institutions, what we find is uh, the the system is available, but the the kind of uh, features that we use within the LMS is very minuscule. Uh, usually, five to ten percent. This is this is not a research data, but we have found that a lot of uh, features are not used. So please go and explore uh, if you can use a bit more of the learning management system uh, effectively. To, for example, the next stage would be to kind of track the students, see the quiz analytics, create a learning path, and things like that. Yeah. So I've already shared uh, the content management system and important thing, uh, somebody mentioned quiz, but we can also have different types of assessment in a learning management system. For example, open-ended assessment, short answer type assessment, interactive assessment, quiz, even multiple choice quizzes as various forms to it saying that whether uh, it can be one answer or multiple answer, or should we show the feedback, not show the feedback. Uh, and uh, it comes with bunch of features. Whatever you can think of doing it uh, face to face, uh, uh, we could potentially kind of replicate the same thing online. Uh, the assessment methods online. Of course, uh, uh, we had a discussion on case study and things like that, which need a bit more thinking through in terms of how we will deliver it. But uh, we have tried all this kind of. Uh, uh, we get all this kind of request in terms of the different type of assessment. We have mostly found that uh, at least 80 to 90 percent of the assessments that were delivered uh, offline uh, can be also done online very effectively. Uh, of course, there is this part of cheating that uh, that is there. We need to be careful. There are also technologies kind of which helps you prevent uh, some of it. Uh, for example, the proctoring kind of exams and things like that that we leverage a lot in IMB. Uh, so, based on the intensity of the uh, assessment that you're doing, you may want to leverage technology accordingly. Okay, uh, so some of the best practices uh, while going online is uh, we thought uh, you need to st start small. If you have not uh, used a learning management system, not to jump into it, start something small and then kind of build up on it. Uh, use an LMS. If you we see that you have a LMS system mostly used. If you are not, please st start using LMS to kind of teach. It will kind of leverage you to kind of. Initially, it may be difficult, but uh, it kind of helps you a lot in the later stage. Uh, we also find that uh, while going online, it's important to have a communication channel going. Right, either it's email or WhatsApp, whichever is important. So please decide on the communication channel that you are leveraging with the students. It may be uh, if it is email, stick to emails and answer to that emails, or if it is WhatsApp, stick to something uh, which the student use more than. Uh, this. Okay, uh, just wanted to share that uh, uh, techno. Uh, I started with saying that the technology has kind of evolved. Uh, technology has always remained, but we feel that the role of the teacher is the most important thing to kind of leverage this technology and take it to the students. So there are different type of technology available. Uh, we could only cover very few minuscule uh, uh, like LMS and CMS and a uh, few quiz questions. But you, what we would recommend is to look at what you want to teach. And there would be definitely technology nowadays. It's become very, uh, very uh, inexpensive also to kind of deliver some of this to kind of uh, leverage what you want to actually deliver as a teacher, right? Okay, I think that's kind of the thing that we wanted to share. If there are some questions, uh, we could we could take some questions and uh, I will hand it to, to Usha after that. Is there any questions that...
comes in. You can also raise your hand. Uh, you can kind of unmute the mic. It's been a long session. We will be also kind of showing the Swayam platform uh, that we have put the courses. So if there are no more questions, uh, we would hand it over to Vijaya to kind of show questions. Okay, that's great. We hope that you leverage the technology within the classroom. Uh, I hand it over to Vijaya to kind of show show the uh, so I'm, uh, since we are going to set up this uh, we would request uh, for some two minutes to kind of uh, switch screens and uh, bring the swim portal on back yeah by the way thanks a lot for interaction a lot in the session thank you Very good afternoon and welcome back. So there were a lot of questions around the uh, Swayam platform. How do we, you know, enroll, how, not enroll, how do we offer courses on Swayam? So just to give you a brief, Swayam is a program initiated by Government of India and uh, designed to achieve three cardinal principles of education policy, which is access, equality, and quality. So I'll just do a screen share and uh, show you Hello, am I audible? 
please let me know if i'm not audible by you know unmuting yourself or putting it on the chat window avijya uh, a bit uh, speak a bit loudly please okay is it audible now yeah it's audible and uh, the audio is much better now thank you diksha yeah okay uh, you see that uh, we have put up the swayam platform and uh, there are various national coordinators on swayam so these are the uh, national coordinators for swayam aict cc igno imd ncrt nptel ugc so each of these institutes which are uh, the national coordinators of swayam handle a different uh, portray you can say like for example imb of uh, is the national coordinator for swayam for all management courses so in case you want to uh, you know launch a course on swayam on management then we are the national coordinators and uh, in the chat window we have uh, put up a email id uh, on which you can write and probably we can take the conversation ahead from there i would also like to show the courses which imb is offering on the swayam platform so these are the list of courses which we have on swayam advanced corporate strategy arts and culture banking and financial management Uh, you can see other courses like business environment by iisc jaipur then uh, consumer buyer behavior by ellen belinkan institute of management continuous quality improvement by nabh crm by professor shanesh of iim bangalore so currently for the july semester we have uh, 24 courses on swayam offered by i am bangalore and there are three other courses which are offered by other institutes so the procedure is very very simple please write to us on the id imbswayam.imbac.in in case you want to offer courses on the management uh, platform so if there are any questions uh, on swayam we can answer that or if there's any question if you want to understand how you can leverage the swayam platform while you are teaching we'll be more than happy to answer that also Usha, I suppose there are no questions. I will hand over to yeah. I'll Vijaya? hand over to Usha for the closing remarks. Yes, please. Uh, uh, if you could, uh, if you could speak on how to develop a MOOC course for the Swayam platform. Some okay. basics of how to develop a MOOC course for the Swayam platform. Okay. Okay. No worries. For example, if I open up the course on uh, customer relationship management by Professor Shainesh. so first and the starting point for creating the course would be that i define what are the topics included which i want to cover if i look at the course on customer relationship management the course uh, is a six week course and the professor is covering topics like customer attention centricity centricity lifetime value and customer value management then you need to define what are the learning objectives or what are the key takeaways a learner would take after completion of the course secondly you need to you know define uh, in detail what each week would cover for example if i am talking about week 1 on introduction to customer relationship management we'll be talking about meaning and definition of crm what are the benefits why should business adopt crm so you are basically detailing out each and every topic in detail and then you need to uh, and these are all uh, these details you need to fill as part of the proposal which you are sending us as management coordinators and uh, the second thing is like you need to also define at this stage what is the grading and the certificate policy if you see for crm course the weightage is 25% weightage for weekly assessment and 75% weightage is for final exam for swayam we have uh, various uh, centers allocated in which the learners are supposed to go and take that fun final exam physically so if you ask how do we leverage pedagogy when it comes to building of the course for example if uh, professor shenish decided that you know i will be talking on uh, 
CRM applications, applications of CRM in different industries. So what Professor Shanesh has done that he has interviewed uh, different people from different industry. For example, somebody from the manufacturing center, somebody from the healthcare center. And then he had uh, his entire week on applications of CRM different industries is built around that. So uh, in my experience, the best way would be to first detail out the, the, the six or the seven weeks which you want to offer as part of your course, then flesh it out in terms of what kind of pedagogy you want to leverage. Okay, for example, meaning and definition of CRM, I want to, you know, start with a discussion forum question, followed by a detailed definition, which I can put it as a PDF, followed by the benefits of CRM in which Professor Shanesh would be able to add value. So first and the foremost is that you define your course outline, then flesh it out in terms of the various pedagogy you want to leverage while developing the course. So thank you from our side and uh, any course available for pedagogy in teaching literature. Uh, yes, sir, we have one course. Just a second. There's a course on art and culture to new management by Professor Damodar. And then there's one more co course on uh, what is the course? leadership through literature. Yeah, essence of leadership in which uh, we have uh, taught leadership concepts uh, leveraging literature. Thank you so much for your time and uh, being a great audience. And I would hand it over to Usha to do the closing remarks. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I hope you found the workshop useful. And I see somebody has asked, what is the criteria to do a course on Swayam? There is no criteria. Um, what I would suggest is like, you may want to do some research about the topics that are already out there on Swayam so that like there is no clash. So um, you can just reach out to any of the coordinators about uh, your interest in creating a course and then they will send you a form, a proposal form, and they'll guide you also as to how to fill it up. So it has the whole curriculum map as to uh, what are the topics that you're going to do and things like that. And then it has to go through a committee, Swayam committee, who will approve. Once you get the approval, you can start uh, building on the course. So now that uh, I have answered that question, I would like to wrap up this uh, workshop. As uh, Director Rishi said, we started with one way video and audio, and now we have moved to two way where the learners can interact with, not only with the faculty and also with each other. During the pandemic, all of us had to move completely uh, to online. There is no going back now. Having discovered the benefits of um, teaching online when the pandemic gave us uh, no choice, we should embrace it as a valuable addition to our um, education tools. I think we shouldn't be threatened by, uh, you know, the online uh, teaching. And um, access to the internet is getting cheaper and... Um, I did hear from someone that, you know, there are uh, places where people are not still able to access good internet connection, but most of the uh, region have access now. I think the government is also working towards that uh, in the future, in the near future. And everybody has a mobile with bandwidth and technology will keep improving in the coming years. And already uh, 5G is almost here. So I think... Uh, the online uh, learning is also going to improve uh, in all the regions across India. And uh, since uh, things are all going online, there is also a lot of push and encouragement from UGC with the current policy. And UGC is also working on enabling us to go online by conducting such wonderful workshop. It's a great initiative by government. I think we should all leverage us uh, you know, faculty to attend these workshop and, you know, uh, exchange ideas and learn from uh, people who have already done it and, uh, you know, immerse ourselves into the new learning. 
And uh, there are lots of tools that are available to effectively engage with uh, learners online. As Professor Vasanti said, we have to embrace technology and tools. Uh, it is good to be current with the development of the technology and that as teachers, we have to be up to date with what's happening around us and which again reiterates the fact that, you know, it is lifelong learning for us also as mentors, right? So that is one point I wanted to um, uh, uh, let you know all. And then the new generation will be more comfortable online. Like we see that with our own children, right? Like they are uh, more adaptable towards technology. So if we don't engage them in the way that they learn, I think it is not going to be effective anymore. Um, we also have to create a healthy social learning by way of discussion forums, online group discussions, question answer sessions, and panel discussions. And there are many more uh, tools to engage uh, uh, with the social uh, learning. And we have to be creative in engaging our audience. Uh, also, we are at an early stage of all these uh, changes. The role of the teacher is changing from transforming information to facilitator who encourages the students to explore and learn. So I think the change is happening and it is happening too quickly and we have to adapt to the changes. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude by thanking UGC for collaborating with IIMB to conduct this workshop. And uh, we wish you all the very best. Thank you, Deeksha. I'm done. Thank you, Usha. Thank you, Usha ji. And uh, on behalf of UGC, I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Krishnan, sir, Director, I am Bangalore, and the entire uh, I am Bangalore team, uh, including Vasanti, Madam, uh, Vijaya, Diljit ji, and uh, Usha ji, and all the participants who have joined uh, from all over the country, uh, all the faculty members, the HRDC directors, vice chancellors, all the participants for uh, taking part in today's uh, online uh, the capacity building workshop and it's been a great i hope it's been a great learning experience uh it, it was quite an interactive session so we'd like to know the feedback from all the participants so thank you all thanks